gotta kill, gotta fight, gotta crush, D, Ma, Me, Act, gotta fight, gotta destroy, <laughs> gotta crush, D, Ma, Me, Act. Give me one guess what I was listening to. Getting ready for this, huh? Absolutely. What's happening? What is happening? Welcome, everybody around the world. What an exciting show it is. It is the 150th episode of the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Actually, we did a couple more because there was a bunch of bonus episodes. But yes, yes, Sean, it's the big 150. Go figure, right? Crazy. Crazy. Goddamn electric. A year and a half, 150 shows. And we ain't, and in, and in the great words of, of, of uh, hold on, in the great words of Chacho's Tacos, and we ain't stopping anytime soon. Got a lot of great shows lined up. A lot of, a lot of good. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, everybody. I'm excited about today's show. Um, I'm excited that you're with us here. And, and thank you so much for supporting the show uh, in, in the, uh, in the uh, last year and a half. Let's quickly talk about a couple shows that are coming up while we're here, while I have you here, while I have a, a, a captive audience, so to speak. Let's talk about the next couple of shows coming up this Wednesday. The one, the only, the notorious, handsome Dick Manitoba coming on the show. Um, yeah, there you go. Handsome, handsome Dick coming on October 6th. That's this Wednesday, uh, there will not be a show a week from today because we're doing some Antidote NYHC shows on the West Coast. Wednesday, we will be back Wednesday, October 13th for Brett Rasmussen from Ignite. And then we got uh, two weeks from today, October 17th, we got Frankie Bella from Anthrax coming on the show to talk about his new book. And then we got Richie Crutch coming on Sunday, October 24th. So there's a lot of great stuff coming up. Get your shoes and socks on, kids. It's right around the corner. That said, uh, what up, everybody? What's up, Mandy? How you doing? How's things in Tallah Tallahassee, baby? Um, upstate Rick, I love you, bro. Yo, I got my, um, I got my, uh, my scarf, bro. Thank you. What's up, Whitney? How are you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have Dick and Richie. I know. That's an old school. That's an old school. You know, there's not a lot of dicks out there. You know, that's an old school name. You know? There you go. <laughs> right on, sister. Um, yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Whitney. I'm just for very fortunate to, uh, to be able to do something that I love doing. You know? So that said... Let's bring on uh, Mr. Where is he? What happened? What happened to? What happened to the hardcore shutterbug? We have lost him. So you know what? In lieu of that, let's bring on. How about? What's up? What's up, Tim? <laughs> what's up, everybody? <laughs> Man on are, the are street. You, yeah. Are you? Are Not you our the, guest today? I guess I'm a guest. You, yeah. Are you our guest uh, photographer for the day? That is me. Where is, um... by the way, this is Tim Daly, one of our photographer friends. So let me find where is photo of the day. Hello? Oh, I think he's back. Hold on. I just heard him. I just heard him pop in. Dude, what's going on? I, was, I could see you. You couldn't see me. I don't know what to tell you. I can see you. I see you. And hey, do you feel boxed in, strung out? <laughs> What's up, Tim? What's up, What's Tim? What's up? What's up? Where are, where are you, Tim? What's going on? I'm out on the streets in Bushwick at the Revelmatic pop up show, number 30 for them. And uh, about to see Fire is Murder. Ape just played. Uh, big time fan of the A7, the Ape crew. And uh, I'm out here just waiting for Fire is Murder to get started. The Stephen Gallo band. There you go. Now, yeah. for the people, to, so being it's our 150th show, we're bringing on a 
guest photographer today uh, to do in conjunction with Stephen photo of the day. So let me find, let me find our photo of the day. Oh, here it is. Okay. Like this photo a lot, Tim. All right. Show me which and I'm one. A, and I, I'm a big fan of your work, man. Ah, thanks. So here thanks. we go, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This is uh, Tim Daly, sponsored by Stephen Messina, Hardcore Shutterbug. <laughs> <laughs> photo of the day. Wrong answers only, please. Here we go. Bam. Here we go. There you go. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. That's a great shot. And you got the you got Steven in the background there. The, the one shot he could right? get. Oh, there he <laughs> yeah, is. Steven right? Richard, God, yeah, Steven Richard, the armpit. <laughs> right. I got the hardcore fire and sword in the photo as well. Yeah, look at that. Well, it's a great it's a great shot. And okay, is it is it Nacho Libre? Yeah. <laughs> Coming uh, off the top rope. Is it Jimmy Superfly Snooker? Is it Ray Mysterio? Is it, the Undertaker? is it the Undertaker? <laughs> is it Ray Mysterious? <laughs> Yo, I made it in there too. You did. That's how yes. I did. Yes, you did, bro. There you are on the left, Larry, playing guitar. Yep. Awesome. I kept you in there, Larry. I saw you and yep. I was like, you made the cut. You made the there. cut, Larry. <laughs> Larry the Hunter made the cut. Is it Boba Fett's bedroom moves? Is it Stone Cold? <laughs> Is it nice to see some new blood on the show? Well, thank you. Yeah, we got a little. We got to mix it up a little bit. Is it Led Zeppelin? Is it a good one, Rich? Is it the innocent bystander crusher? That's. Is it? It's right. Is it Rappos? I mean, I, with a mask? I, I, is it Rappos with a mask on? <laughs> Secretly came out of retirement. Yeah. Is it my drunk uncle when everyone drank all the Medellos? <laughs> Ah, it's funny. All right. Okay. Is it the is it the gluten free motherfuckers? Um. Okay. All right. Right answers only. Does anybody know what this is and what's going on here? Nacho Libre. <laughs> it's the hardcore Nacho Libre. Is it Drew as the Gimp? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, well, there's a clue there, being that Larry's in Larry. Is it Limp Biz Bisknut? Is it Chucky Brown? That's good. Why don't you tell us what this is, Tim? So this was from the uh, Mad Ball show at Times Square Park back in April, um, when it was Wisdom and Chains, Mad Ball, uh, um Man, host of others, but I, I realized I never posted this photo before. And when uh, Stephen was asking me to send the photo, I came across this one. And I was like, hands down, this is this is hardcore, and especially hardcore in the park in Thompson Square Park. And uh, yeah, during Murphy's Law, because Larry's up there playing. And uh, yeah, that's a pretty wide angle. So I think I got out of the way just in time before this guy landed on everybody. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, one of the dangers from shooting in the pit is now, flying when, bodies. When you when, when you shoot an event like this, unlike these other sissies like Stephen Messina and Rich Zoller, who were on stage shirking and cringing, you're actually like right in the melee. Yeah, you know, is, is, I, is that is that standard operating procedure for you? For me, most time. I mean, I like to be there and get the good, if not, it's just a side view and you can only get so much. So being down the front is uh, is where the action is. The bad part is, you know, you, you get really hurt if you're not looking a lot. So uh, yep. this is one of those events where bodies are flying quite often. Um, luckily, Rapones was at that show with a lot of, uh, you know, first aid for people with heads cracked <laughs> open. So <laughs> here's... You know what? Let's do a bonus round because you did send a second picture. And uh, this is the second picture that came through. Um, and I know who this is. Uh, but why don't you just tell us what, what, what this is? I mean, obviously, uh, this looks like Madball, correct? Yeah, this is Madball. Uh, first round of Madball with Will playing uh, guitar and uh, Hoya and Stigma's off camera. But this was a show at the Limelight. 
back in '93. Mm-hmm. So one of wow. the early early ones. Um, so yeah, I was scanning these. I never scanned these images, and I was doing them yesterday. So I wanted to share one uh, something a long time ago. So it's uh, also this is me up in the rafter of limelight. So up on the second level. So. You know, I, one time I actually got up into the rafters at the limelight. Oh, yeah? You know who was playing there? It was Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam was playing there right when that record hit big. Oh, and okay. It, it, it was so incredibly crowded. I actually was on the second level, and I climbed up into mm-hmm. literally the rafters, and I was scrunched up into, into like something this big all the way up in the ceiling watching Pearl Jam, you know? Oh, that my show God. was the amazing. Last, the last seat in the house. <laughs> Were you at that show, Stephen? Pearl Jam show, absolutely. That was that's probably might be my favorite Limelight show ever. It was uh, I. Yeah, I knew you were gonna man. say that. It was Come I. Come on. I am a huge fan of that band, as you know that. And I've actually, you know, we've actually shown that picture as picture yeah. of the day. Oh yeah. Yeah. A long time ago. It's been 150 episodes. A lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. Yeah, I sort of was in reaction so, to having Pearl Jam shoved down my throat. That's that right. Video. Take it. Take it. No more, please. You know? It's 30 oh, years Ray, now since the first yeah. record, so. Yeah, a lot. It seems like it, Ray, Ho- Ray Hogan was there. Uh, you know, it's, it's like, um, what do you call it? Uh, who threw the perfect game, Yogi Berra said. Over the years, he's met a million people who said they were there. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It was I. You know, yo, you know what else was I? <laughs> How about that friggin' Sopranos movie, huh? Uh, that's uh, garbage. Uh, it was I. Uh, it was as good as The Irishman. Yeah, wow. I like The Irishman, actually. Oh, God. All right. All I right. know you, well, you and, we'll you and Craig there. Silverman <laughs> both didn't say too good, too many good things about the Sopranos movie. Yeah. Oh, it was horrible. Uh, all right. Wow. I want, my, I, want my, I want my time back from that. I yeah, went back it, and watched other episodes, that's for sure. Hey, Tim, thank you very much for being hey. part of our 150 Yeah, Tim, show. thank you. Appreciate Thanks it. for having me on, man. I like we it. We love your work, and, bro. Uh, hey, uh, shout out from the rest of the people down the block. I'm going to get back because uh, Fire's Murder is going on, so it was perfect timing. All right, we'll so. see you later. All right, man. Congratulations, guys. Thank you. All right. Yeah, that was That's pretty cool. cool. You know what? We got it. We got a few more photographers out there. We're going to try to drag into the game. Get uh, We'll find uh, Rich Zoller. And Michelle and Danielle, we'll try to get a few of them. Mix it up a little bit. You know you what? Know? We got a lot of great people out there, and uh, you know why not? Why not have a little fun? And uh, you know, gives gives me a few days to not dig through the archives a little bit. You know, there'll be no fun had here. That's right. <laughs> there'll be no fun. This but we do great, have potatoes. This is a great invention, by the way. The potato. No, the sweet potato. Oh, the sweet potato, yeah. This was a great invention. I back I back this. You fully just, support the sweet potato. There's a strange... I have Doc, I have this strange growth in my head. All right, enough silliness. I'll talk to you in a bit. All right, later. Hey, listen. Why not at that kind of a show? Let's do it. Rack bones! Rack bones! Rack bones! Rack bones! What's happening? What's up? What's up? Excited, man. 150. I know, man. It's been it's been great. And uh what a guest today, right? Paris. Huge admiration and esteem respect for Paris, man. Definitely. I'm excited. We have a lot to talk about. But uh, you know, let's just run a real segment. I I got something really cool at the flea market. Go ahead. uh, I'm gonna show it. It's kind of a little younger than my age bracket, what I collect, but I always get this stuff. I'm going to show the dumb stuff first because they're just cheesy. The dumb stuff? Well, well this know. is I, well, I, this I, is certainly the show for that. Well, because well, you're going to build up to the cool <laughs> thing, all right? It's only Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but I got this for a dollar. It's 1989. You know, it's still the 80s. And uh, I got these for a buck a piece. I got these today couple of yo-yos you know they're cool they're, they're for strictly to get rid of and sell you know but and then yet you know i got those today but yesterday i found you know a whole stack of stuff of uh teenage a stack of cards and i'll show a couple of the cards real quick you know teenage mutant ninja turtles was cool for the kids you know back then pizza they were always on the pizza 
But I like this dude, right? Krang. He lived in some guy's stomach. And uh, the thing about the, you know, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is like, you know, in the comic book world, they're highly collectible. The black and white Eastman and Lards, Splinter, right? But the black and white Eastman Lard comics of uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are like thousands of dollars now. If you have like the first few black and white ones, the original ones. And uh, I thought this was really cool. This came with the cards. And uh, it's from a company called P Peter Pan from Newark, New Jersey. And usually things like this were made by a company called DECA that put out like, you know, play sets for kids, whatever. So pretty cool to find this old stuff in this cool condition. The plate's really nice. I saved it for last. You know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So that's the collectible of the day, man. It's a short and sweet. Uh, you know, bring me back on to say hi to Paris later. Uh, I have a list of questions. As they get knocked <laughs> off down the show, I might have one left. I think I have some really good ones. You know, Paris is... Don't torment the fucking guy, bro. Well, no, but he's really undershadowed, you know? Like, he he's really a momentum force in hardcore, and I'm glad, you know, he's going to be on today. We're going to hear, us, you know, where he comes from and how he becomes such, you know, powerful force, you know? I love Absolutely. Paris, man. He's my homeboy. All right, we'll see so you in a bit. I'm back on to say hello later, and uh, happy 150, everybody. You've been along, you know, we've been doing this shit. It's hitting me, you know? Well, goddamn electric. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live landmark 150th episode. Buckle in, kids. It's going to be a long show. We're going to do what we do. Don't be scared. We are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill. Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, and the Texas Silver Rush. It's a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. Goddamn electric. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces as well as sell the style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and, believe it or not, social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock and Roll Hall of Famers Greg Rollet, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. During this current, never-ending pandemic, all information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages, and of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. Come on now, how about New York Hardcore Comics? Opened in 2013, selling comic books, punk rock, and hardcore memorabilia, toys, statues, skateboard decks, tapes, vinyl, and all things. We love helping bands push their demos and new tracks, so please stop by and drop off your new music, even if your band sucks. We have a new, we have in-store events like Magic the Gathering and Warhammer tournaments, plus meet and greets with bands and some live performances. Open seven days a week and shipping worldwide. Find us online through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and ePay. 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 Located at 117 Main Street in Dobbs Ferry, New York, www.NewYorkHardcoreComics.com. One more for the road. DTFM Vinyl Distro is a record store that specializes in underground music, punk, ska, hardcore metal, and more. Located in the heart of Fargo, North Dakota's industrial district, shop in person or online at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com, where the motto is, death to false metal. That said, let's clear the deck. Let's bring our guest on. Let's get jiggy with it. Okay, everybody behaving myself in there? Nobody carrying on. Kujowski is so excited. Good. If you're excited, I'm excited. Um, let's see. Drew, what, what is the one show you wished you had gotten to see and the show that disappointed you? Who cares? We have such an excited guest about to come. Ask me that later, bro. Let's get our guest on. Who cares about me? I'm good over here. Need no stinking badges. Can we ask Chromax questions? Yeah, you can ask Chromax questions. At, at, at in the designated in the designated question zone, you may ask the proper. You may ask whatever you want. 
whether our guest gets gets asked, <laughs> it has to go through the filter. So here we go. Yes, we're bringing out the big dogs, ladies and gentlemen. Today's guest is an American musician, songwriter, director, and camera operator hailing from the island of Manhattan in New York City. As a musician, he is known for his work with the bands White Devil, The Mad, Sam Sarah, Psychic Orgy, Cro-Mags, and currently Agros. During the, during the golden age of music video, he directed numerous iconic music videos and currently works as a motion picture and television camera operator. Please welcome, coming at us from Brooklyn, New York, on our 150th episode, Mr. Paris Mayhew. Hey! That was uh, quite an introduction, Drew. Thank you. Bro, do you remember the time your girlfriend drank my contact lenses? No. Which girlfriend was that? You don't remember that? No. Was it Tommy? Huh? Was it? Who was it? Yo, this popped in my head before. I don't. I we you. I don't know what we were doing, but we were in a hotel room, right? And oh, in Devisha. No. 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 And and I'll give you some of the clues. And for some reason, I didn't have a contact lens case, so I took my contact lenses out and put them in a in a glass and put it on the on the whatever, and went to sleep. Now, you know who it was? Is the girl you dated from Canada. Uh -huh. And I woke up in the morning and the glass was empty. And I was like, yo, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> you don't remember this? I was like, yo, you drank out. My contact lenses were in there. <laughs> she, drank, she drank my contact lenses. Crazy. Anyway, I thought that would be a kooky way to start the show. That said, that said, what's the latest? What's happening with you, man? How's the pandemic treating you? What's new and exciting? Um, you know, I hate to say it, but the pandemic was a great thing for me. I mean, you know, of course, it was horrible and it affected everybody, a lot of people in terrible ways. But for me, who prior to the pandemic had such a uh, hectic work schedule it taught me a new perspective on life and how free time is important in the time i spend with my wife and the time i spend doing things that are not work and it was the thing that opened up the door for me to make chaos magic and create the agros and start playing music again i mean i i, I guess i'd become comfortable in this idea that i wasn't a musician anymore and it's funny to take so much time off. It, 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 there's, there never seems to be the same urgency you had when you were young. Urgency is something that's very important. But uh, when the pandemic happened, I found myself with all this free time. And I didn't even really think about it. I just shifted gears from work to picking up my guitar and making a recording and working on the video. And, you know, I didn't really even have an end game in mind. It was just... I was just exercising my abilities. And then when it was finished, I had the freedom to put it out and it, and it changed everything overnight. I went from being a guy who used to be a musician to a guy who was an active musician. And uh, it's a great thing. And, and then I got wrapped up in working again. I've been working on TV shows and movies for the past six months. And so it slowed down my second release, but I was mixing yesterday. Uh, the new song is called City Kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the you know mechanics of marketing and putting things out, it won't be released until Halloween. But that's soon enough. You get the, uh, the hold on. Where did I see that? The pandemic kiss shirt, Paris. Pandemic kiss, pandemic kiss shirt, rocking it. <laughs> yeah, that's that was one of the things that over the pandemic I was. I, I became addicted to ordering t-shirts online. And every time I bought one, I would post it as pandemic t online t-shirt addiction number, you know, and this was one of my pandemic kiss shirts. Yes. John and jelly, John and jelly says, hello, Drew, please pe tell Paris. I say hello. Uh, Paris, John and jelly says, hello. What's up, John? Just, 
<laughs> is uh, the new uh, is the new recording? Uh, is it is it the, it's really uh, is it the same guy playing drums? No, no. Uh, I have some other recordings with Cobbs, the guy who played on Chaos Magic. And but, this uh, is this is Cobbs, right? Yes, it is. Okay. That's, he's a Brooklyn native, um, amazing drummer. We teamed up. We were able to do that recording of Chaos Magic and a couple other songs. And uh, the pandemic uh, forced him to relocate to. Bro, who rings a doorbell like that? What's that? It, it just it? repeats. You press it once and it does that. Anyway, Cobbs moved down to Louisiana. But I, I do have one or two more tracks that he played on that will be released. And he's just a tremendous player. And people always ask me about him. So that's why I wanted to have a picture of cool. him to, to show. So he's not just a name that I keep mentioning. Yeah. And somebody asked, where does where does the name come from? Yo, here he goes. Darren asks, where does the name Agros come from? I mean, it just stems from the word agro, but I just imagined, I just imagined it as plural, you know, like a bunch of agros, you know, the the kind of people that 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 are drawn to the same kind of music that I am, the same people that were, were grew up in basements listening to Black Sabbath, you know, just in different parts of the world, but we were all doing the same thing in different basements, and uh, you know, I used to refer to them like as the the fellow mutants, but. Uh, it just seemed like agros was more appropriate. And it actually was, you know, part of a story idea I had that there was like a fictional band in the story. And, uh, you know, it, you know, after a long time of writing so much music and, and not having an outlet for it, you know, the Chromags was my outlet for my songs when I was in high school. And now I didn't have an outlet for it. And I kind of used this agros thing as an, as an avatar to uh, carry my music in, uh, in a way of just, of, uh, you know, kind of like displacing it from myself. I know that sounds very abstract, but you know, when you're not, <laughs> when you're not a musician, you have to put things in some kind of context. So it fa I found it easy to put it in this idea of the story. And like I said, I had the freedom to record and make that video and then it was time to put it out. And I was like, oh, I'll use that story name. And so that's where I got the aggros. Makes sense. Did you, how did you come up? Did you, uh, did you grow up in a musical household? Was, was music part of your upbringing? I grew up in a very musical household. My father was a record producer, manager, publisher, uh, songwriter. Uh, you know, I, 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 I commented once that it, how cool it was when I got a song on the radio station, the hardcore radio station on uh, Grand Theft Auto 4. I thought that was cool until I realized that if you change the station to the country channel, that there was a song on the country channel on on um, on uh, number four that my father wrote. So we both had songs on Grand Theft Auto Four at the same time. And, Your dad. Uh, he had a, he, he discovered Johnny Paycheck and Jeannie C. Riley, and he wrote songs with Bill Haley and the Comets, and he recorded Charlie Parker, and you know. Your dad, uh, Aubrey Mayhew, he had uh, he would he had Pickwick Records and Little Darlin Records, right? Correct. Little Darlin was really little, his uh, little Darlin. Excuse me, Little Darlin Records was really the vehicle for Johnny Paycheck, correct? That is correct. Yeah. They 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 formed the. My father just kind of discovered Paycheck uh, when he was not doing so well and decided he was going to make him a star and <laughs> wanted him to, you know, to be all in. So they, be, they became partners in little darling records. And it was really just a vehicle for putting out a uh, paycheck. But of course, once the label got going, they signed up many other artists. And I, the guy, the guy, I met one of the guys from uh, Epitaph record, not Epitaph. What's that? Uh, what's the big uh, label in Seattle that put out all the grunge bands? Uh, um, sub pop, yeah. The sub -pop. guy from was telling me, he goes, you know, I yeah. model sub pop after Little Dharma. Got it. I remember, you know, when we were hanging out back in the late 80s, early 90s, you always had a great pension and knowledge of what would you what, what would you call that? Um, rebel country music? Is that what outlaw? 
outlaw, outlaw country music. And and you always had a great love for, I mean, what was that place we used to hang out? The Village Idiot, that place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, stocked, I stocked the jukebox there. Yeah, the jukebox was all all that kind of, you know. David Allen Coe. Who David taught, Allen Coe. Who, who, who used to live in a limousine in my backyard in Nashville and taught me how to tune my guitar. Wow. I used to like, you know, I when my father got me a guitar, I didn't know how to tune it. And I, he would go, oh, get Coe to do it. And I would go out in the backyard and knock on the window and he was in there, you know, like sleeping in the back of his limousine. He had this old limousine and he'd pop the door open and I'd hand him the guitar and he'd go, burn, 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 burn. he would just tune it up real quick. And after he started getting annoyed, I guess, by me, and he said, would you like me to teach you how to do it? So David Allen Coe taught me how to tune a guitar. Wow. What is, what's happening in this photo here? Give us a little, what's going on here? That, well, you know, I, I gave you that picture in answer because I knew you always ask this, do you ever grow up in a musical household? And you yeah. know, my father being a record producer and just being surrounded by people like Johnny Paycheck sleeping on the couch, you know, coming out of my bedroom and seeing Paycheck sleeping on the couch and having to fight for the t television remote. There were all kinds of people around always. And my father's best friend was Cowboy Jack Clement. And this was just a day trip we took to a place where you could go see buffaloes and you see people dressed like Native Americans and stuff. And my father wasn't around, so Jack Clement drove us. He's the tall fellow in the back on the right. And uh, Cowboy Jack Clement and my father met when my father was running a country music jamboree in the 50s. And, and, he, and is, is this in Tennessee? This is in just outside of Nashville. Okay. And he brought uh, he brought Jack to Nashville, and Nashville, uh, and, and Jack subsequently became a very famous producer uh, on a, in his own right. He produced "Walk the Line" for Johnny Cash and most of his relevant records. Whoa! So yes, I grew up in a musical household. And here you are with him many years later, right? Yeah, this was very shortly before he passed away. Mm -hmm. I went and visited him in his house and uh, I just kind of barged in. I knocked on the door and, you know, one of his assistants answered the door and said, can I help you? And I was like, yeah, tell Jack Aubrey made you his son's here. <laughs> then the, the helper came back and goes, which one? <laughs> I said, Paris. He said, okay, come on in. So I went back the entire afternoon talking to him, you know, <laughs> my father. I just, you know, my father had just passed away and I, you know, I, I, I guess I wanted to speak to somebody who knew my father in his prime, who, who actually knew him. Like I knew them. I knew my father. He was very much that figure, but I didn't know what kind of person he was. And I wanted to speak to someone who knew him and loved him. So I sat and talked to Jack all day. I remember you telling me that your, your dad was a big uh, John F. Kennedy memorabilia collector. He was. He was in, he was in Texas when Kennedy was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And he came out of his hotel one morning and he just said he saw, you know, women standing in the street weeping with their hands and their, you know, their face in their hands. And he was like, what the hell's going on? And he went into the lobby of his hotel and, you know, everybody in there was weeping and they were talking about the assassination. And uh, my father just like, you know, realized the impact of such a tremendous thing, a president being assassinated in his time. It was like a historical event. He, you know, being somebody in the entertainment business, he tried to figure out a way to, you know, market somehow. And he didn't know what to do. So he went down to this local recording studio and he took a bunch of tapes, tape players, tape machines. You know, back then they had these like Nagra machines. They were portable. We used to use them in the film business. Yeah, yeah. In front of the TV and he mic'd up the television and he just recorded the news for 24 hours. And then he got in his car and drove to New York. And he went to this little record label there because he wanted to be in the record business, but he didn't really know how to, to get into it. Mm -hmm. He went to this little record label and he said, you know, you have to press albums of this. And he somehow convinced them to do a run. And they ultimately sold 4 million copies, and which is unheard of at the time. You know, back then a gold record was 10,000 records. So he obviously made an impression on this little on this little label. And, they, and, and so he said, you know, with that with that card that he wanted to play that card of being able to, of selling those records and said, I want to sign uh, original artists and put them out. And so mm -hmm. he went down in Nashville just looking 
and he went down during Jamboree Week, is you know fanfare or something that goes on in Nashville, and he uh, was just going around town, and he went up to this guy, and this guy was trying to. He's like, "Hey man, you you're starting a label out, you know? I, I want I want to sell you a song." And he played my dad this tape, this demo tape in the bathroom. Like he went out to the car and brought this big tape recorder, plugged it in the bathroom, real real, plays him this demo, and uh, my dad says. I don't care about this song, but who's that singer? Man, that's great. Like I was like, oh, don't worry about the singer. It's a song I'm selling. It's a song. And he goes, no. He goes, you take me to the voice on the tape, and I'll buy this song. So they get in a car, and they drive over into East Nashville, which is like a real shady neighborhood, and they come, they're coming over this bridge, and my dad's like, what the hell's going on here? And they pull over on the on the side of the road, you know, no lights on the side of this bridge, and my dad thinks he's going to get jacked, so he pulls out his gun, and he's like, what the fuck? You know, you better not be setting me up. And the guy's like, no, 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 I swear to God. The guy's down here below the bridge. Some shady, uh, old school Nashville uh, shit. You know? so my dad took him under the bridge at gunpoint. And when he gets down there, there's like a bunch of cardboard boxes and like an old couch and a bunch of empty wine bottles. And sitting on the couch was Johnny Paycheck. Wow. Living under, you know, this guy didn't want to bring him there because he was didn't want him to know that he was also living under the bridge with Paycheck. Uh, they, like, they had set up shop down there. So my, you know, paycheck just sitting there looking all, you know, even, you know, even at the bottom, he was, you know, arrogant. And my, he goes, he goes, the guy says, this is Aubrey Mayhew. And uh, paycheck was like, you yeah, what do you want? And my dad says, I'm going to make you a star. <laughs> Get the fuck up. And literally they got in the car and drove to New York. That's and awesome. like within a week, they were recording Paycheck's first hit record called A11. That's, that's My dad made, made on his promise, and he uh, made him a star. And uh, here you are at a young age with your brother and starting to get acclimated to the guitar, correct? Yeah, it was definitely helpful to have a, the cool older brother. Right. You know, who turned me on to like Kiss and Judas Priest and... He got at the guitar first and learned how to play it first and was in bands first. And I just kind of like, you know, followed the big brother lead. And so you you gravitated to the guitar and you, you picked up the guitar. Um, well, initially, I played bass, mm -hmm. you know, because my brother was playing guitar. So, you know, he convinced me that, you know, he's already playing guitar. So we need a bass player. So I there's, only, there's only room for one guitar player in this household. Yeah. <laughs> And, and you know, and I was, and I and I was primarily a bass player. I am still. A, I you know I played bass in my first couple of bands, and you know this band reported missing in, in New York. And uh, when, when I started the Chromags, I was the bass player. And I in in based on availability of other musicians, we all moved around until it was like musical chairs. But I started out playing bass. You know, I, when, I wrote a lot of the early, I wrote a lot of the early Chromag songs on the bass. Like "World Peace" was a song I wrote when I was in "Reported Missing," on the bass. Who? Yeah, let, let's not get let's not get in front of ourselves yet. But you you eventually you make it. You 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 come up to New York and uh, you're living with your mom and you go to Art and Design High School and then School of Visual School of Visual Arts, right? And well, I didn't know I was I'm I'm a New Yorker. I was in New York. I would just go down to Nashville to visit my dad. Okay. Um one uh, co correct me from one of the early influences I know you've always very spoken very highly of is the band the Stimulators. Is it safe to say that? They were I, I wouldn't call them an influence. They were kind of like my gateway. And after hearing yeah. the Sex Pistols, you know, like being in school and, you know, I discovered, you know, I was in high school and I discovered, you know, basically from skateboarding in the middle of the night, you know, that I could get into bars and clubs when I was 14. Right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, one night I was in this bar and I heard the Sex Pistols and, you know, it was like this kind of like startling experience. And in my high school, we had these three punk rockers. So on Monday... I went to, back to school and there were these three punk rockers. They were seniors. I didn't really know them. And it's funny to this day, I imagine them like, like a Mount Rushmore of punk rockers. Like, cause they look kind of like Ramones. They all wore leather jackets and they were always standing together and they never smiled. And I just walked up to them and I was like, do you guys have a sex pistols album I can borrow? 
and they're all like <laughs> looking down at me. And then one of them looks, the other one look, then looks back at me and goes, yes, <laughs> yes, I do. And then the next day he brought in the Sex Pistols album. And then I, I eventually returned it to him. And when I returned it to him, he said, if you like the Sex Pistols, you'll probably like the stimulators. Just mm. look at the Village Voice and, you know, you'll, there's advertisements in there for live bands. And, uh, you know, I, I looked in there and had, he was right there. Stimulators, I didn't know at the time, but played almost every week. So I went to Max's Kansas City and I saw the stimulators and, and they were, you know, kind of New York's answer to the Sex Pistols. You know, the, the singer Patrick uh, did kind of did Johnny Rotten's act. And but they weren't really like they weren't like a cover band or anything. And they, they didn't yeah. really sound so they didn't really sound like the Sex Pistols. They kind of had their own style, but they were kind of for New York, this transition between the punk yeah. scene, and the hardcore scene. I really felt like they were kind of the first hardcore band. Uh, yeah, so I, it, well, it, 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 just, just as a sort of uh, music uh, archaeologist, it seems that the stimulators in a lot of late ways were sort of like missing the missing link between the old guard of, you know, the punk CBGB's crowd and what came after that, which would have been right. The bad brains and, and uh, the early uh, New York hardcore bands, correct? The, the missing link is is a great analogy because the missing link doesn't exist. You know, they, they always talk. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> no one's ever found the missing link. Right. And it, it's, it's missing. Kind of, it's that's missing. That's a good way of putting it for the stimulators because because they never recorded anything properly. Didn't make an album. Yeah. They really are the missing link. You know, there's really no evidence of how great they were, but they were. Yeah. And they were the thing that connected me to the hardcore scene because. I went to go see the stimulators and the bad brains were also playing and I saw them and uh, I saw the mad and all these other bands of that era, which I would never have been exposed to if it wasn't like the the step by step of hearing the sex pistols in my club and asking the guys in my school and them telling me about the stimulators and then going to see the stimulators and seeing the bad brains and then like realizing that there was this whole nightlife that I could that I could go see just by leaving my house at 11 o'clock at night during the week, every night of the week, which I did. That was crazy. Tell us, tell us about the mad and, and screaming mad and screaming, uh, George. You know, one day, you know, I had gone and seen the mad a couple of times. <laughs> cause that's, cause let me just say like, that's sort of like a band that's been like forgotten in the shifting sands of time, you know, the mad. It, it, and it's odd because they really were yeah. extraordinary and they had all the things that make it off the hook, man. Misfits logo, you know, Misfits last because they had this great logo and, and, and the mad had that too. But, you know, I went and saw them and they were kind of guar before guar. They had the masks and all, you know, performing all kinds of yeah. crazy performances on stage. And they were like the hot band in New York along with the stimulators and a few others. And, um, they represented this kind of this phenomenon that was new to me was, you know, I was used to seeing bands in stadiums. I loved Rush and Aerosmith and Van Halen and Kiss. And, you know, there was those bands. And then there were these bands that I was kind of seeing in the clubs that I liked. And of course, I began to notice that I liked some of these bands I was seeing in the clubs just as much as I liked the stadium bands, which was a, a surprise to me. So I began to uh developed this idea of like what I could do musically. And then one day I was at school and I heard this kid just standing in front of school say that he had just auditioned for the mad and was now the bass player of the mad. I was like, what? Like a kid from my school can be in the mad? Like they're one of the hot bands in town. How the hell can he be in the mad? This doesn't how make can this be? I was furious. Like I, I like, how did I miss this opportunity? Of course it wasn't an opportunity that presented to me, but I couldn't help but think that. So that night, you know, that day after school, I went right down to the village and like walked around and I was looking for Screaming Mad George. And uh, I, you know, I went to Max Kansas City. I went to CB's. I went to, you know, every club, like Peppermint Lounge. I, you know, I just went looking for him because I knew he hung around. Mm -hmm. but I couldn't find him. And then, you know, I, I was looking in the paper for the Mad to play, but they weren't playing at the time. I, what I didn't know was they were taking a hiatus while they were, you know, retooling. And then I saw an ad for Max's Kansas City that Butch Lust and the Hypocrites were playing. And with guest place bass player right. screaming at George. So I go, I go to that show, and when the show is over, I see George and Butch Lust standing there, and I walk up. And you understand, I'm like 14 years old. I'm like, teeny, you know, long hair. And I walk up to him and Butch Lust, and I go, I understand you're looking for a bass player. 
and they're both like looking down at me, this like kid. And I and they, and George says, no, no, we already found somebody. I go, yeah, yeah, I know that kid. He goes to my school. I'm better than him. And he he said, um, okay. So me and he goes, come with me. And we walked from Max's to his apartment. He had this huge loft. And it, and at that time, I was going to the high school of art and design. You know, I thought I was going to be an artist. And meeting George and going to his apartment was so extraordinary because it was like one of those lofts you see in movies, like massive lofts, yeah. paintings and sculptures. Yeah, one of those Everywhere. one of those great like Lower East Side or West Village lofts that were like just like wow. And, yeah. and, and, and when you took the freight elevator up, it just had gates on all sides. As you took the freight elevator, he hung paintings in the elevator shaft. Oh, just that's cool. So like as you're going up, you're that's passing awesome. Like evil demons. And that's awesome. Crazy shit. And I'm, th- I'm like, this is the coolest. And we go into his massive loft and he's got amps set up and all this stuff. And we sit down and uh, and he puts a guitar in my lap. And uh, I was, and I, I started playing a little bit. And he, he like was the first person to show me, show me palm muting. And he goes, "But we're looking for a bass player." So he gave me a bass, and he started playing me some songs. And I played a little bit. And he goes, "You know, you're right. You are better. So you're the bass player of the Mad now." <laughs> and I was like, "That's amazing." And I spent about a month and a half jamming with him, getting ready and rehearsing the songs, practicing, and we played as a whole band. And once we had all the songs down. We were all in the studio, like the guitar player who looked like Jesus, you know, and George and everything. And I said, hey, George, check out this song. And I started going, dun, 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 dun. I started playing world peace. Dun, 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 dun. And all of a sudden, his, he just grabbed my bass, like by the strings, to stop me playing. And he said, I write the songs for this band. Yeah. And I said, yeah, but you don't even want to hear the song? And he said, no, I, I write the songs for this band. That's it. And I said, so you're not going to let me write any songs? He said, nope. And I said, all right. And I took the bass off and I put it in the case. I was sorry. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, I can't be in a band where I can't write songs. And that's when I knew that I had to start a new band just playing my music. And that's what I did. And that, and that pretty much segues to this, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and I know there's, a, I know, listen, I, I know we're, we're we're moving in leaps and bounds here, but uh, we have we we ha- we do have a lot to cover, and um, here we go. And I love that picture. This is a great picture, and uh, I was at this show. Uh, I played with you at the show, I believe, um, because we have a great story about about this one. But this is uh, an early Cro-Mag show with uh, original vocalist Eric Casanova uh, singing. Yeah. Correct. That's right, original singer and songwriter. Yeah. Um, who, who who often gets overlooked. Again, you know, we were talking about that before because he never made it on to any recordings. Mm-hmm. But he was in the he was there in the beginning and he wrote a lot of lyrics to a lot of the songs that ended up on Age of Coral. He wrote the lyrics to Hard Times, uh, Life of My Own, Street Justice, Survival of the Streets. You know, he, you know. A lot of the, you know, I've, I've said before, a lot of the things that people feel are the manifesto of the Cro-Mags were written by Eric Casanova. Yeah. Um, that, I just want to point out to everyone, the guitar amp that Paris is playing out of there, <laughs> the, the infamous, what, was it a custom? What was the brand name of that? It was a the, the 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 cabinet is a PA speaker, a custom PA speaker, and the head is an acoustic bass head. Because you know, I was the bass player. I I started when I started in the band. I was the bass player, and uh, that was my bass head. And when I transitioned to guitar, I just I did I just kept playing through that. So it's funny because some people always allude like, oh, you had all, all the expensive gear and all this stuff. I'm like, I, I played with what I had, you know. Yeah. So the, the story, so this, this, I believe, I believe, and I, I could be pretty, pretty on, on, on with this is that that show is this show from, uh, uh 19, uh, I don't have, I, I can't see the date, but, uh, 84, 85. And, um, I'm on the bill with the high and the mighty. And this was the Cro-Mag's first gig. 
And a lot of people out there don't realize that the Cro-Mags existed before, you know, John Joseph and all that, before Age of Quarrel, you know, uh, Eric Casanova did a bunch of shows. I think I saw every show that Eric Casanova did singing for you guys. There wasn't a lot, but I, I think I saw every one of those shows. But my, my, my memory of this is after we were playing, we didn't have a guitar amp. And I ran, I, I remember I ran around the corner. Of course, this is going back, what, uh, almost 40 years now? Could that be? So I ran around the corner of CBGB's <laughs> and chased you down on the sidewalk. Yo, yo, is it cool? Can we, can we borrow your guitar cabinet? And you were nice enough and gracious enough to let us, to let our guitar player in the high and the mighty, Rodrigo Toro, borrow um, your, that, 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 that PA stack. And I remember it was like real soft on the side. It was like, yeah. it was like plastic. And, and <laughs> of course. I remember. Yeah. And, and, it, and it was funny because, you know, at that gig, you know, I, you know, we, 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 we had been rehearsing and, you know, nobody had cell phones back then. And yeah, you know, right. Eric lived off somewhere in Queens. I didn't even know where he lived, but we, we had been rehearsing and I kind of felt like, you know, I, I was anxious, you know, I wanted my music to be on stage. So I was like, I just went down to CBGB's one day and I walked in and I, and I saw, you know, the booklet that they used to have yes, with the, the bands that are playing and it's, and it's just said HR mm -hmm. and, and it probably said the high and the mighty couple of bands. I don't remember what it said, but I just like walked up and I grabbed the pencil and I wrote the name Pro Mags in there. And, you know, I, and I looked at the guy, I was like, that's cool. And he was like, yeah. And I, I subsequently went and told, I was like, Harley, we have a gig at CBGB's. He's like, oh, that's great. And it was like, you know, a couple of weeks away. So we didn't think it was any kind of big deal. So we get together, we rehearse, no Eric. We get together, rehearse another time, no Eric. Nobody's here, nobody's heard from Eric. And then there we are, the day of the show. We haven't seen Eric in weeks. He doesn't even know that there's a gig. Woohoo! Me and Harley are just standing out in front of CBGB's. Oh. And we didn't have a phone number for him, you know, like nothing. And we look up and there's Eric walking across the street, like with this big smile on his face that he always had. And he walks up, he's like, what's up guys? And we're like, we have a gig today. And he, and he, he looked terrified and he goes, oh, oh, oh. And, and literally me and Eric stood on the corner with me, like, you know, like pounding out the songs and humming the riffs. And he sang along, that was our rehearsal. And awesome. uh, it was pretty dreadful. You know, if you ever saw the video of that show, you know, some of the songs he had, some of the songs he kind of like got twisted around. He was nervous, you know, he wasn't, you know, you know how it was. It wasn't necessary, you know, like nobody went to school for being a hardcore singer. You know, we just liked Eric. So, hey, Eric, come and be the singer. And the next thing you know, we he jams a couple of times and he's thrown up on stage and doesn't even know there's a gig. But uh, there, there are some there are some funny pictures and the, the show was great. and It still had an impact and nobody noticed but us. Well, I remember, I like I said, I mean, I think I saw every show you guys played with Eric. I mean, I think there was only two or three or four, right? Yeah, yeah, there were only a couple of official gigs. And then there was one we did that was kind of like a loft party out in Brooklyn or Queens. And I, I got to honestly say, I don't remember which one it was because I so rarely ever left the borough of Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. But, I, you know, it was one of those things where a bunch of people hanging out on the Lower East Side, me, Vinny, Stigma, Harley, and a bunch of other people, Jimmy yep. Gustavo. And then suddenly it was like we were all on the subway going to the – you know, on the L train or some train that like, where does the L train even go? I didn't even know at the time. And we got the off L train. We, what is that? We went to some loft party and, uh, you know, we were all pals and me and Roger Moret, you know, had, you know, you know, I'd shown, showed him to play, you know, there were times where he, there were, there was talk about him being in the band. And so he knew some of the riffs. And so somebody asked us if we'd get up and play. So we decided I would play guitar Roger would play bass because he already knew how to play world peace and life of my own. And me and Roger and, and uh, Harley playing drums and, and Eric Casanova singing, we got up and did the, the first Chrome Eggs gig. So it was actually prior to this, but it was an official gig. I think we played four songs. Makes sense. Um, you know, moving forward. Um, Eric, Eric, uh, Eric is out. Uh, John is in and you guys uh, turned up with this at a certain point, which was really great. And some people, you know, out there really, really, you know, to this day, of course, really um, love this and feel like this was in a lot of ways really the most uh, true representation of that, that of the band or, or that era 
Um, how do you feel about this looking back many years later? I agree. It was, you know, we were all on fire. It was before outside influences, you know, you know, started coming in. It was, it, it, it was kind of still the singular vision of the music that me and Harley had assembled over the years that led up to this. John was new in the band, so he hadn't kind of, a, you know, imposed his, his will on things. And, and it was just very raw. And it was also, also prior to the kind of like more metal influence, which, you know, like Doug came, Doug Holland came in very soon after this, like right before we recorded Age of Quarrel. But he was like, you know, very powerful uh, person, personality and also a powerful player. And he was really geared towards metal. He really loved it. I mean, he taught me a lot about it, uh, you know, while we were on tour of Age of Quarrel. You know, we'd be in the tour bus and I would say, to Doug, I was like, hey, can I borrow, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin physical graffiti? And he would say, yes, you can. But first, you must listen to this. <laughs> he would give me like a King Diamond album. And I was like, oh, and I would have to listen. He'd make sure I listened to the whole thing. And then later on, I'd say, hey, Doug, can I borrow Nevermind the Bollocks? And he'd go, yes, you can, Paris. But first, <laughs> you have to listen, listen to, this. to this. He did that over and over and over. And he basically gave me an education on metal. But even prior to that, you know, just his playing style, even though he was playing the same songs, there's a, there's a very different feel between that demo tape and the album. Oh, yeah. And there's also a polarizing uh, taste thing. You know, there, there are people who yeah. swear by the demo and there are people who swear by the album. Sure. And I, I can't argue with either one, you know, because they and, both... and the track that was on the demo that, that's, that, that was, is unique to the demo, is that um, that's Everybody's Everyone's Gonna Die, die right? Yeah. Is that what it, yeah, Everyone's Gonna Die, sure. I don't really know why that didn't make it onto the album. It just didn't. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I love the demo. I, I loved recording it. It was odd because we recorded the whole thing and then there was some problem with the tapes and we had to go back in the next day and record it all over again. Yep. So, I mean, that kind of brings us to this, which, I mean, not even arguably, but this is one of the most iconic hardcore recordings ever made on the planet Earth. And in my opinion, um, and, and this is really in a lot of ways, dare I say, the, 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 the recording that really put New York hardcore on the map. I mean, you know, agno Agnostic Front, Victim and Pain, incredible. Put New York hardcore on the map. But this came along and really, really kicked down the door. I mean, this is, this is absolutely an, an iconic, iconic recording. Um, still holds up to this day. Still sound, still sounds great. Um, any thoughts on this? Sort of looking back um, all these years later, and any any um, anything anything that you could share with us, maybe that you know uh, from the recording process or just this era, anything that resonates in, in, in a good way. I mean, I think everything about it resonates with me in a in a good way. It's you know. It's a source of pride. You know, it was the end result of, you know, my artistic sensibilities being validated. You know, up to, up to that point, it was just kind of like sitting in my room, playing riffs and riffs and riffs and like presenting them to my friend who I was in a band with. And, you know, we liked it and we would play our brains out and, you know, and you sit there crafting these songs and you don't even know what they're for when you're doing it in your mom's kitchen. Yeah, <laughs> you, <right. laughs> you know, perspective. You don't, you don't understand what kind of context it could have that we'd be having this conversation about it so many years later. Um, it was just, it was just gut, you know, just playing exactly what I wanted to play at the time and then having it like, having something that I can hold in my hand to put out, that was a big deal. But, you know, the subsequent years and the effect it had on people and, and, you know, I, I, I don't know how, I think it's all encapsulated in this simple phrase is that I've, I've heard so many people that come up, come up to me, look me in the eye and say, age of coral changed my life. Mm. So many times that I actually mouth the words when they say it, they, walk <laughs> and they go, I actually like finished the sentence with them 
because it's it's never different. They might say more afterwards, but they always say that exact same phrase, and it's very it's it's a startling thing to have not changed for all these years. I mean, it happened, you know, a week ago on set. You know, I'm on set and some grip, you know, is pushing the dolly, and I turn back and I'm like, on this next one, can you do a boom? And then, and he goes, he goes, yeah, man. By the way, Age of Coral changed my life, and I'm like. Thank you very much. So yeah, I mean, it's all encapsulated, encapsulated in that one statement. It, it's it's almost beyond what it, it's almost eclipsed what I feel about it myself. Yeah, because my own right. opinion about it, my own feelings about it, the circumstances, all the things that led up to it, all the things that happened subsequent to it, are kind of they they're they're eclipsed by the effect it's had on people. And that's well, well put. Well, well, well yeah. put, man. Yeah. No, well put. It, it's like, you know, it's like when people, you know, uh, it, it, it's iconic. It, it's it's influenced so many people. It's like when people started with, you know, I hate the Beatles or I hate Bob Dylan or I hate the Sex Pistols. Who cares about your opinion about this? This is yeah. stuff that changed the musical world. Who cares about your puny opinion on this? <laughs> and, it really, and it really doesn't matter what I think about it. You know, I'm happy and proud about it. But uh, ultimately... Everybody else speaks for it more than I do. Right on, brother. Was there someone at the helm at this record, production-wise? Uh, like, was there a point man? Like, in the, when you guys were in the studio at this point, was there a producer or like who? Who? Or, like, who sort of was the point man production-wise for this? Um. Well, it, it's hard to say, you know, because there's so much that goes into what is called producing, you know. Myself and Harley guided the music for a long right. time. So it was right. there was a very clear vision of what it was before we went into the studio. Then by the time we got signed, we were um, managed by Chris Williamson. Right. And Chris Williamson uh, got us signed and he was the producer on the album. So at that stage, it became a different thing because Chris, Chris's, Chris's role to me in the big picture of the hardcore scene was he put us on bigger stages. Right. He, he put us in a bigger context. Like even the way you're, you, you have that album, you know, as wallpaper behind me on, on this show is, you know, is a presentation that Chris made happen. Um, the context change. And even the way we went into the studio, you know, went into a proper studio with a proper engineer, Steve. Remote. And excuse me, that was high rise you guys recorded at? It was East Side Sound. Okay. And uh, and so he got, you know, a proper engineer, Steve Remote. And uh, oh, yeah. Wow. That's and, sure. And Chris did his best to guide the chaos. Right. Um, but even, even, in, even, even with the fact that, you know, we were fighting him and, you know, there was a lot of pushback, he never gave up. He was never like, these guys aren't listening to me. Fuck it. He never, he showed up every morning. And he was there with that big, crazy Chris Williamson smile on his face. And he was motivated. He was driven. And and to, and for anybody to say that that drive that Chris had didn't put us where we ended up is, you know, fooling themselves. Uh, I know the reason I say that is because a lot of people disparage Chris and talk about him being a thief and all that kind of stuff. And anybody who says that just doesn't have any perspective of, of how businesses work. They don't know how much band rentals are. Or rehearsal studios or guitar strings or you know all the things that we, you know they don't they, they never did a spreadsheet and actually know how much things cost and how much money was made and how much money was distributed and how much money could have been stolen and none of that is really a reality yeah so i just thought I'd say that because chris deserves a lot of credit he not only put us on bigger stages but he put a lot of other bands on bigger stages he made the rock hotel uh, music uh um venue for us to all be exposed to the world in a way that made people pay attention. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Makes a make, makes a lot makes a lot of sense. When you when you when you sign this, you guys sign a, a, a record deal with Profile, or did you sign a development deal with Chris Williamson? We we signed a record deal with Profile Records, but it was like a, a the other side of it was that Chris got a deal as a as a label guy, as a boutique, by, like, right? By delivering us, he was like, basically, I deliver, I deliver the Chromex, you give me my own label. 
But unfortunately, the way the deal was set up, Chris's deal was only for two years and ours was like for five albums. Oh, you know what I mean? So at, at some point they decided to push Chris out and we were stuck there. Oh. That's when everything started to fall apart with uh, us and the label because we had recorded best wishes. We, you know, it was, it was, we were separating from Chris Williamson and, uh, and uh, outside influences, other ANR people were sticking their heads in, you know, saying that they were going to buy our, 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 our record of best wishes and put it on a bigger label. And then, you know, it stalled the, the release of the record. Actually, Chris was still with us at that point. And he was, you know, encouraging the sale and it would have been a great thing, if, you know, because best wishes was kind of like a, a step, a step in a, it was definitely a lateral step. It wasn't a step up. It was definitely a lateral step into a different world. Um, you know, Age of Coral opened the eyes to, of a lot of metal fans to the Chrome Eggs. And you saw this phenomenon happen live uh, where, you know, we, at first we were playing to, to hardcore fans exclusively. And then we started playing at Lemoore's. And then the next thing you know, we played at yeah. CBGB's and there would be, you know, uh, a, a, you know, a couple of hard, a couple of metal heads there. And then the next week there would be more and then more. And then by the time we were doing best wishes, if you went to a Chrome Egg show, the hardcore fans were a minority just because they were the ticket buying public was bigger than the scene yeah. at the time. And this album was kind of a lateral move into that, uh, into that scene. And, and other people were interested in putting it out and profile wasn't really capable of what it took to break a band. That could have been the album that broke us. Uh, but it, it, it reminds me a little bit about our old, uh, uh, regarding our old friends run DMC who were on profile as well. And yeah. they, they, you know, I mean, you remember when we worked together, they friggin' hated those guys. They, yeah. the, the, the animosity they had for profile records was palatable, man. You know? Yeah. Well, there was, you know, there was profile was not run by music lovers. It was run by business guys who yeah. didn't, didn't do business well. And it was an un unfortunate thing. And, and again, you know, like it seems like a lot of people blame Chris for, walking us into that but you know it, it could have been any other label and nobody ever gets treated well by a label every every band every story it's always the same story at that time all record deals were structured the same way sure and uh it, it wouldn't have been better and, and the band would the band was not going to last anyway for a variety of other reasons right. so, so so anybody pointing at chris williamson or pointing at profile and all that stuff and saying that it played a major role in it it really didn't and and it sucked. You know, I put, it sucked, but that's not the reason. You know, I put up the uh, the the label of the record before. Uh, you know, all songs written by um, all music by um, Paris Mayhew and uh, Harley Flanagan. And you know, I, I just uh, that combination of you and Harley uh, musically, uh, you guys uh, you guys made a lot of magic. To, I mean, in retrospect, all the bullshit, whatever. But you guys certainly. Um, when you guys worked together uh, back then, you guys really made some magic, man. Agreed. Um, the the yeah okay so yeah and and I remember and I remember from of course this era you know the best wishes uh, and and even I think maybe in a year or two sure I remember when best wishes came out uh, but you guys worked you guys like dare I say toured on this record for like two years like a while right i remember shows with doug i remember shows with rob buckley like this went on for a while right no no um, we put out the record and i think we toured for maybe two or three months uh-huh and then um we lost doug right and and pd simultaneously um not actually Doug came back and then it just didn't last. We, I wanted, I wanted, I tried to make it last. I held out as long as I could. And then we held like one of these massive auditions and you know, it was another thing Chris orchestrated and like 500 people showed up and it was like a parade of all kinds of different people. And, <laughs> and we auditioned some young kid and he, he got into the band and that was, it was Rob. And, uh, and then we, um, we ended up putting together a bunch of, you know, me and Rob I basically sat in a room and uh, for like the end of a winter and a whole summer, putting together the entire Alpha Omega album, yeah. just, just the two of us. So there was no playing during that time. 
And then at the end of that summer, we got together and we made a demo and we decided to go on tour and we did a, a quick two week long tour to test out the material. And it was just miserable, terrible time. And that's when me and Rob left. So there really wasn't a lot of activity. There was, was there was two weeks. There was the initial couple of months of touring when the album came out. And then, you know, another thing that played a major, well, that's that's a whole other story that's not that interesting. <laughs> we, only, we only, we only it, it's amazing. You know, people always ask me, oh, we, you were in that band for so long and you toured for so long. If you put together all the months that we toured during Age of Quarrel and Best Wishes and even Revenge, uh, it, would, it wouldn't even be a year. Because we would always we would always implode, you know. We imploded after Age of Quarrel, like we were in Europe on tour, and there was this whole debacle where Chris Williamson's wallet was stolen, and and we all went home, and when we got back, it was like a big, you know, thing. That's where we pushed John out of the band, and uh, and then after Best Wishes, PD and Doug left, and then that was a big stumbling block. And then, uh, you know, when we were going to make uh, the, you know, the, the Alpha Omega album, you know, it just wasn't a happy place to be. There was just, you know, after Rob and I had spent like almost a year writing an entire album, it was great and different, you know, just to have other people in the band behave like, you know, douchebags. It just wasn't interesting anymore. It just, it just didn't make any sense. Why, are we, why were we sharing all this music? So we decided to move on. And we did. Yep. Makes, makes sense. Hey, this sounds like a good uh, moment here for me to take a sponsor break. Let me, uh, let me shout out a couple sponsors and we'll come back and we will continue in our quest, okay? Yes, sir. Well, there you have it. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Our guest today is Paris Mayhew, filmmaker and musician. We are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, Generation Records, Chacho's Tacos, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chain Reaction Records, the Texas Silver Rush, and the Organic Grill. It's a vegan restaurant located in the East Village of New York City at 123 First Avenue, featured in New York Magazine, New York Times, and Veg News. Their dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every dish on the menu can be made gluten-free. This year, they're celebrating their 21st anniversary, and they're all about having a great time and enjoying amazing, clean food. They have now fully reopened for business and look forward to seeing you. Get in touch with them. Order some great food at www.theorganicgrill.com. Also, since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay in the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as T-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and on Instagram. Want to mention a couple of other upcoming shows, just so you know, just so we're on the same page here. All right? Coming up, the next the next, next four shows, okay? Wednesday, November 3rd. Super excited about this. Love these kids from Long Island. Uh, this is our first in our series of side trips, the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live side trips. We're going to be getting into other musical genres, doing a couple of other things. Uh, this is our first side trip show. We got Adam and the Metal Hawks coming on. This is a great band. These got these teenagers. Uh, this is going to be great. Uh, Wednesday, November 10th, Andrew Klein from Strife, World Be Free, Birth Hold City, and War Records coming on the show. Sunday, November 14th, I am super excited about this. Sam Cutler, legend, legend, former tour manager of the Rolling Stones and the Grateful Dead, uh, has a book out called You Can't Always Get What You Want. My Life with the Rolling Stones, the Grateful Dead, and other wonderful reprobates. Um, this is another one of our side trips shows. And then Wednesday, November 17th, come on, Bob Riley, upstate New York represent Jason Bittner from Stigmata, Flotsam and Jetsam, Shadows Fall, and Overkill coming on the show. So 
there you go. Um, yes, Adam and the Metal Hawks are cool. They're great. Good stuff. So, got a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of good stuff coming up. Um, where is? Oh, yeah, yeah I want to mention this too. Um, next weekend, Friday night, we're up. We got to do some uh, shameless self promotion here. Uh, this coming Friday night, October eighth, Antidote NYHC. We're doing a couple shows in celebration of our upcoming record, Scar, that's coming out in November. Um, on Unity Worldwide Records. This Friday, October 8th, we're playing Alex's in Long Beach with Fang, Dissension, and Count Time. And then we got to get in a car and drive up to the Bay Area the next day. We're playing Winters in Pacifica, right, right outside San Francisco. Uh, we're, do, we're playing Crash Fest. So anybody out there, please come out. We'd love to, we'd love to see you. Um, also, I want to mention that... Uh, oh, yeah, you know what? Oh, actually... Sam Cutler's book. What's up? Reading Sam Cutler's book. Excited about having him on the show. You know, he was the architect of Altamont. Also, we've mentioned this a couple of times. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles, Volume 1, 1980 to 1989. This is a book that is currently at the printer getting printed. Um, it is free. To all you patrons out there, all you got to do is just give me uh, your uh, your mailing address. Just send me the shipping. Uh, seven bucks in the United States, twenty five bucks um, international. Join Patreon, support this show. One hundred and fifty shows deep. The only way this is happening is because of your support. I mean that, not to sound corny, but you know, it's your support and the sponsors' um, support that that has really uh, made this whole thing happen. So please uh, join Patreon. Uh, if not, there's a, there's a PayPal address there. Don't be shy. I want to shout out some of my recent patrons. Uh, Lisa Fierro, Gajewski, uh, Goran Mellon, uh, Nick Dis Disbella, Joe Frank, Slimy Slim, Eddie Ahmed, Dave Roebuck, Dan Steely from King Nine, and just before the show started, Mike LaRoche. Thank you all. You know... Yeah, it should be interesting. We'll talk to him about Altamont. That should be interesting. Sean Brennan, what's up? I hope you're getting better, dude, because we got shows to play next weekend. Um, yeah, Rap Bones, you can have one. It's okay. Um, Sid, where are you, bro? Sid the Kid, what happened? You know? Uh, Spaghetti Lee, yeah. Th this, is a, um, this is a super chat. Um, a good way to contribute to the show if you have a burning desire question and you have a question that you you really want to ask our guest do a super chat i can't i can't miss it so there you go um spaghetti lee thanks for everything drew thanks paris shout out to everyone sid the kid what happened to you man did you uh do i need to call you up and like we were going to do we were going to do yeah where is sid the kid someone text sid guy, man. What is wrong with these people? <laughs> Gajewski, what's up? Love you, Drew, and thanks for doing well. Okay. Um, that said, let's bring our guest back on. Hey, man. Hey. I think we lost Sid. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll do... If you I'll, do I'll do Adam we'll, of the day. You and me, will, you and me will, will do it without him, but we'll give him a couple more minutes. You know what? Hold on a second. One of your one of your uh, one of your viewers has been writing in. Uh, when is the first episode of Guitars Are for Life, which is a go ahead web set series I'm going to be doing about my guitars. Initially, it's going to be about my guitars, and then it's going to then I'm going to have guests. I've already shot parts of two episodes: one with Sean Pierce from the Toilet Boys, and then one is about uh, Clyde Moody. But uh, I'll be, I, I've just been wrapped up in working, and then I got wrapped up in doing this the song City Kids. And once City Kids is done, I will finish up episode one of Guitars Are For Life. Fair enough. Um, let me... Let me... I want to make sure I didn't miss any great pictures that you sent me. 
you know, here, here's one. Not, 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 to, not to digress, but, you know, I just want to say this is a great shot of um, – give it a second to load up. Come on. There you go. This is a shot of uh, Cro-Mags playing CBGBs. And I, I saw – I don't know if I was at this show, but I was at one of those, you know, a bunch of those early shows – and wow, uh, after seeing you play with Eric, and then you know here comes this lineup. Actually, I don't see Doug in this picture. This this might have been before Doug. Yeah, I mean, I don't, Doug, think, I don't think we ever played with Doug at CBGBs. Huh. I think at once Doug was in the band, like I said, Chris was trying to put us on a different platform. I don't think he allowed us to play there anymore. I think we only played at the Ritz after that. I remember seeing. Cro-Mags play CBs with John and it was like, ah, fuck, man. Wow. It was intense, man. It was really intense. Very intense. What else? Oh, here's another one. Well, yeah, this is, yeah, obviously if this is the same show, this is a, this is a shot that's been around quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I think this that one. This one from CBs. Oh, that is the same show, but it's funny that people you can see Adam Yauk right above. Yeah. And, and 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 look and over your and over your shoulder, there's that cabinet in that head. Yeah, <laughs> that's Miles Kelly with the sunglasses on. He I was always in, thought that was Petey. No, that's Miles Kelly. Huh. And and Adam Yauk and that's uh, Ilroy in the front row with the tattoo on the back of his head. Sure. And that, and on the right in the right hand corner is Noah Evans, the bass player of Frontline. Front. That's right. Whose whose dad was Gil Evans? That's correct. Yeah, and this is one of the only pictures I've ever seen that has all four of us in it live. You know, like me, John Mackey, and Harley. Yeah, show. you guys are you guys are ripping it here, man. Obviously. Um, that said, do I have anything else from that era that I don't want to that I don't want to skip? Oh, there's this one that you sent me. This one's kind of I guess this is a little. Um, a little later or because it's Irving Plaza, right? Yeah, that's Irving Plaza. That's the only time we ever played Irving. So that was with DOA. Nice. And that was in 85. Got it. Okay. Let's, I guess. I love Irving Plaza. I was just there the other night watching. I saw Cheap Trick there. Oh, and yeah? It's, it's just amazing. You know, like, I don't, it doesn't matter how many shows I see there. I stand in the balcony and. It's like I look around, it's like, you know, the city is just haunted with all these memories. You know, I look around and I see the Bad Brains on stage. I see, you know, Minor Threat on stage. I see the Misfits on stage. I, you know, I see every band that I've ever seen, the Beastie Boys. I see them all standing on the stage as if they're all there together somehow. I know that's strange, but like. And then no, she, it's not. It's not. To me, it's not. I I, I, I understand 100% what you're saying and. and Yep, I still yeah. live in the, I still live in the same city where you and I grew up as teenagers, man. I, I I see a lot of ghosts here, man. Every every street corner I stand on, I see like I, the other day I was on the subway and I saw this kid got on the train and I thought it was Eric Casanova, but you know, sixteen years old. I do that sometimes. Like my memory of him is just as sixteen years old, and it and it's interesting because I brought that theme into my next song. My next song that I'm putting out is called City Kids slash ghosts of new york and and it's that ghosts of new york is you know basically just my memories speaking of which is this recording at the board recording age of quarrel it is wow. that's east side studios where you go wow and that picture look, was look at that look at that outboard gear bro <laughs> that was oh, taken by steve remote he gave me that picture wow that's great what is that? Sixteen inch? Is that? Is that? Hold on. Is that sixteen inch two? Is that sixteen track two inch you recorded on? No, it's twenty four track. Twenty four track two inch. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Nice. Let's. Um, okay. Got 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 that. Good. Not we're not. Uh... And then you know somebody had uh, somebody asked about this. Hold on. Let, let me set this up properly. Um, boom. Somebody says. Somebody asked, uh, here is the flyer um, that for the for the We Gotta Know uh, video. 
And Heggs asks, what venue was the We Gotta Know video that was in the intro to the movie shot at? Well, it, there's actually, oh, it, you mean the intro where it's like really big? I'm not sure exactly what he's referring to. Well, there's the, I, I guess so. Let's go with that. The intro, like where Doug Holland is skateboarding around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in Arizona. And it's funny because I I got, you know, the Facebook connects the world. It's it's a very bizarre thing. One day I got a private message on Facebook and it's and it was from Nick Oliveri from Queens of the Stone Age. Uh -huh. And he said, uh, hey, you know, in the video, like there's these four blonde kids wearing Chromax T-shirts. I go, yeah. Uh -huh. He said, I'm the second from the left. That's awesome. But that was at that venue. So I, I think it was in Arizona, but I could be mistaken. But the, the, there's two venues in the video that look exactly the same. And like it's the one where John does the backflip. And then there's one where like you're panning over the audience and everybody's stage dog and it's all in black and white. Looks very similar. But one is Webster Hall, the Ritz. And the other is uh, in Cincinnati. God, what was the name of that venue in Cincinnati? Right on that strip. But anyway, it's in Cincinnati. But they look very similar. Got me. If um, that answers the question. Yeah. And that, that flyer you just showed, you know, was when I finished making the We Got to Know video and it was going to MTV. Right. And, uh, so I made that flyer. It's in my handwriting. And, yes. Uh, and I printed up thousands of them and handed them out all over the city, everywhere. I stood in front of high schools. I went to hardcore shows. I went to dance theory. I went anywhere. I, just same thing I did with the Chromex flyers. I would hand them out to anybody. And the guys in the band would be like, why are you wasting those flyers? I was like, it's not a waste if somebody reads our name. And that's also played a big role in why our, our shows got filled up with people that didn't just look like everybody else at the show. Well, I think history has proven that. You don't preach to the converted. Right. <laughs> Tell me about it. Look at the show I'm doing here. <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, it's like MTV re did actually respond to, to the viewers' voices. So, you know, I, I made a plea to for people to – I made a call to action for people to participate, and they did. And MTV, you know, responded, and they played the video quite a bit with yeah. the help of a lot of people like Scott Ian from Anthrax and Wendy O. Williams and, and, and any a number of people that hosted Headbangers Ball and were given a choice – you know, people, you know, people like Scott doing that early on made a big impression on the metal fans. And it was also part of what that transition, that lateral move I talked about with Best Wishes. If it wasn't for people who were already in the inside saying, you know, giving us basically their endorsement, I think that played a major role. And and, and like uh, Larry says, the video is as influential as the Cro-Mags themselves. And this is actually this was voiced. Um, by your former bandmate, Harley Flanagan, in the New York Hardcore Chronicles film, when he says, for a lot of people, this was the first time they ever saw anything like this. And, you know, people in whatever, you know, rat hole town they were in or the middle of nowhere, this was the first thing that, that kind of came through on the wire. And they were like, wow, what's this? I've never seen anything like this before. And the video had a very, uh, very long reach. It, you agree? It did. And I shot it on a uh, an old camera that my father bought at a police auction. Another contribution my dad made. Well, right. dad, nobody ever thanked him for it. But he gave me this old camera and I just shot everything I, I saw that I thought was interesting, you know, and I didn't really even really know exactly what I was going to do with it. I just thought it sh things should be documented. We didn't have iPhones back then. So I would buy like these hundred foot rolls. And I, when we went on tour, I bought like, 30 of them, I had them in a suitcase and I just shot everything. And at one point when we were traveling, we passed through Nashville and my brother was working at, you know, in my father's TV studio mm -hmm. down in Nashville and they had a little very rudimentary editing system. And uh, my, my brother was like, let's transfer this film to video. I was like, how the hell are we going to do that? And he just got an old video camera and we projected the, 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 the footage on the wall and we did a film to tape transfer by filming it off the wall. And he goes, now I can edit it. And we just started editing. And he goes, what song do you want to do? And I go, uh, I don't know, Malfunction. So we put in Malfunction. We started cutting to it. And he just looked at me and he goes, I don't know, there's something about this song. It doesn't sound right coming through the speakers. He goes, let's listen to some of the, some of the other songs. And the, you know, so we just put the album on in order. And We Got to Know came on. And immediately he was like, oh, this sounds good through the speakers. 
because it's so simple or something like that. And I said, yeah, but it's got this long intro. He goes, well, let's just cut it anyway. And if we don't like it, we'll just cut the intro. <laughs> said, well, you can't do that. Let's just pick another song. But we just started editing. And I had a couple of days off from the tour and we did this marathon editing session. And then when it was done, you know, I just, he made me a VHS copy and we finished out the tour, which wasn't much longer. And I, the first thing I did was I went up to profile with the tape and I said, uh, I was like, you know, I, I didn't show it to him at first. <laughs> but, uh, you know, ultimately they agreed to to uh, do a proper film to tape transfer and uh, and release it. And uh, yeah, it. And the it, thing the thing about the the we got to know video is it it was shot MOS. You guys didn't lip sync anything. It, it, it like right. you, you didn't get the band together and go, hey, uh, let's lip sync this. So. The whole video was just jam sync. Nothing was in sync. You just sort of, right? And I, and of course, because I was shooting it, I'm really to a large extent not in it. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it never occurred to me. I, I never, I never saw thought to myself, I'm leaving myself out because it was my music. Right. All I, all I saw it was a way to elevate and support my music, and that's all that really mattered to me. Of course, in retrospect, if I would have known that the rest of my band members were going to try to write me out the history. I might have played a more active role in uh, making an imprint, at least visually, in that music video. <laughs> a, a, a story Lou asks, can you talk about the filming of the movie The Beat you guys did as the Iron Skulls? I was going to cut out of school to go to the filming at the Ritz. You should have. Because <laughs> it was a great day. It was a crazy day. It was, you know, it's like any other film shoot. They, wanted, they started at 7 a.m., and they opened up the doors at nine. And when they opened up the doors, the Ritz filled, 1,500 people filled up at 9 a.m. in the morning. They they mashed themselves up against the edge of the stage like it was a concert. And uh, we shot all day long. And uh, it was it was amazing. And, you know, John Savage was there. He was one of the stars of the films, but he wasn't in any of the scenes. And Matt Dillon's brother, Paul Dillon, who subsequently became a pal of mine, we hung around quite a bit for a while until we lost touch. He's he was one of the stars of the film. It was like about a gang, and their the gang's favorite band was the was the, the Iron, Iron Skulls, <laughs> and uh, it was going to be Anthrax. Anthrax was going to be the Iron Skulls, and then for some reason the scheduling didn't work out, so they we flew in from the Age of Coral tour, and and did the movie, and then flew back out on tour. But um, you know the the kids in the audience when we were shooting the the video, that when we were shooting the footage refused to chant Iron Skulls like. The AD was up there going, now go Iron Skulls, Iron Crow, Max, yeah. Crow, Max, Crow. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't somebody get really hurt while filming that thing? Um, it, it, I don't, it wasn't there, but it was at a Crow Mags gig. Okay. Oh, actually, no, I apologize. I, I, I should have a better memory of this. A kid jumped off the PA and broke his back, apparently. Yes, I remember this. Yeah. And, it was, and he was whisked off. You know, we didn't even know about it when it happened. We, wow. we found out about it later, but he hurt himself really badly and um, they took him to the hospital and subsequently, you know, Vestron, the film company was sued. The Ritz was sued. Yeah. The yeah. kid apparently insisted that his parents don't sue the band because he insisted that it wasn't our fault and all this other stuff. And it was, and it was kind of a terrible thing because we were advised like, don't speak to the kid and all that stuff. Don't seek him out. Cause we'll, I'm, you know, I wanted to seek him out and, you know, I don't know. I don't even know what I wanted to do, but I felt bad for him. And, uh, and uh, subsequent to that, that was when they instilled the barricade law. Yeah. That literally that day that we were shooting is the reason why every concert you go to now has a barricade. I, re I actually remember that detail of it, <laughs> that, that after that, this barricade thing, be, you know, in order to, to uh, dissuade kids from, from jumping, uh, you know, jumping. The movie, the movie, the beat is dreadful. Like I can't even advise people to go look for it. The the section that we're in is actually cool because, you know, usually in movies they cut scenes in between. You know, they show a little bit of the band playing, then they show a conversation, and then they show. They literally have us playing three songs back to back through in the movie. I remember going to the premiere, um, and. After after we finished playing those three songs, the audience did a standing ovation, ovation, and half of them walked out because the oh. movie was so terrible. I don't think it ever made it into the theater, but it was cool. Let's, let's um, 
let's change gears a little bit. And, uh, you know, I just want to say to everybody out there also, we, we are going to talk gear in a bit. We're going to talk guitars and we're going to talk gear. So hold off on the gear, hold off on the gear stuff for now. But let's talk a little bit about um, the music video stuff that we did together. And um, I want to find this one picture in particular. Well, yeah, this one. Let's start with this one because this is really, um, this was the first work that you and I did together. And um, nuclear assault. Nuclear assault. This is nuclear assault trail of tears. And, um, you know, this was, this was a, a fun day. There I am in my, in my, what I thought a producer should be wearing in that era. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, Amazing. and that's, yeah, you know? your hair, it's awesome. The string time <laughs> with the scorpion. <laughs> but I'll tell you while, while we're here, just, um, looking at this, you know, the guy on the far left with the vision streetwear, mm -hmm. Howie Abrams. I mean, he's yep. the reason, he's the reason why that's, he's the reason that put us together Yeah. because of this video. You know, he just, he just came up to me and he said, Hey man, I want you to make a video for our label for nuclear assault. Uh -huh. Just come to the, come to the label tomorrow at 9am and we'll talk about it. And this was at 4am in the morning at a bar. <laughs> I was wasted. And he goes, so can you be there at nine? And I was like, uh, I guess so. And I basically stayed up all night and went, because it was out in Queens. I had to take the train like to Queens. It was probably the second time I went to Queens, like after seeing the police. Yeah, that, that was, uh, what was what was that label? Uh, in effect. Yeah. yeah. But he, he was instrumental in, in, in making sure that I got that job as a director. And, and, and it was really, you know, even though I directed the Chromax video before that, right. you know, I did it for myself. But when you're, when you get a paycheck, to do a video, then you're a director. Yeah. And then that's when I think you and I were hanging out at the scrap bar or something. Yeah. And I was basically like, what do I do now? And you were like, I know. <laughs> I know. I run a stage. I can do that. And, really? I can do it. I can make it happen. But, but you know, but we owe oh, a lot to Howie. And it wasn't just, it wasn't yeah. just this video. When it yeah. came time to do the typo negative black number one video, he was instrumental in pushing that forward there was a lot of pushback because of because of me uh a personal relationship i had with someone at the label um but how we pushed it forward and the band did too and, and pete did too but if it wasn't for howie that you know black number one wouldn't have happened the way it did i just and had howie on the last show yeah he's he lives across the street from me actually oh. I see, I see him in the neighborhood, but, but he, wrote, I, yeah, he wrote a lot of early reviews for Cro-Mags, you know, talking about how he was diving off his bed into his laundry. Yeah. That's how he knew that the age of coral demo was good because he was diving off his bed into his laundry in his dorm. And, and I, I just want to, I want to, for, for those, for the uninitiated out there, um, I just want to kind of fill in the blank here and say that, you know, yeah, you know, you and I started doing these, these videos together, but, but before uh, we started doing the videos together, uh, you were out uh, doing uh, camera work and stuff like that uh, before that, right? I mean, you yeah. were, you, 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 you did, um, you were, a, you were, were you, a cam you a camera operator on the, the um, nuclear assault video and on MOD, all that happened before we started working together, correct? I was a DP on those, I wasn't directing them. Uh, yeah. um, I, I, did, I done Flotsam and Jetsam, uh mod a bunch yeah. of uh I, oh, the only reason i grabbed this is because you mentioned that nuclear assault video uh-huh this is the guitar that john is playing on the roof is that right yeah because i remember we were shooting up on the roof and i was like but this song this part sounds like it's an acoustic guitar and he goes it is i said do you have one to play in the video and he said no so i grabbed tommy the kid who's in the video who was acting and i gave him the keys to my house and I, we put him in a cab and he went to my house and he got this and brought it back. And this is when John's playing. That's but I've had this guitar my whole life. It's a 1958 Martin. And this is the guitar I wrote Malfunction on. Oh, wow. Mm. Right on. I always say that, you know, you look at your guitar, you know, it's, you know, when I look at this guitar, I see Malfunction. Now, I just want to say also that uh, at that time, I was a stage manager at 3G Stage. 
And here's one of our great supporters, Mr. Yeah. Gabe DiRienzo, who we refer to as the godfather of the film business. He he owned the stage. Um, you know, I still I still see him and I'm very close with him. He's close with my family. And but we did, you know, he was he was our guy, you know. I, I was a stage manager on 3G stage, and you know, he su he supplied equipment, he supplied equipment for us, and and it's in also the video. Hmm? and he's in the video. And oh, that's right. He plays the kid's father in the video. We're like, we're like, give him a in the head and like smacks him. We're like, hey, easy now. Remember, it was great how we used to do those videos. We'd be like, who's gonna play his father? We'll get Gabe to do it. And and the girl that we cast initially to be the girlfriend of Tommy in that video, nuclear assault video was Theo from the Lunatics. Is that but, right? Yeah, and at the, but at the last minute she canceled because I was going to college with her. And I asked her and she said yes, but at the last minute she had to cancel and that's when we got Tommy's actual girlfriend. Another video, of course, that we shot at 3G stage, which was really, as the timeline goes, the next video. Um, and you know what? I should, I should, I should say this just, just, just for, just for history's sake here. Uh, you and I, according to, according to my notes, according to my uh, research here, we did 20 projects together. And, and I, I, will, I, will read the, I will read them off. We did Nuclear Assault Trail of Tears, Biohazard Punishment, Biohazard Shades of Grey, Biohazard After Forever from the Black Sabbath tribute album, Nativity in Black, Biohazard Tales from the Hard Side, Onyx Slam, Onyx Shifty, Onyx and Biohazard Slam the Bionics version, Run DMC, Ooh, What You Gonna Do, Super Cat featuring Notorious B.I.G. and P. Diddy, and P. Diddy Dolly My Baby, Typo Negative Black Number One, King's X Dog Man, Insane Clown Posse Chicken Hunting, The Youngsters featuring Fat Joe Wild Child, Proper Dose Tales from the Hard Side, Flatliners Live Evil, Tales Flatliners, from the West Side, Tales from the West Side. What did I say? Hard Side. <laughs> yes, Proper Dose. We did those back to back as well, which was so funny because I was like, we're doing Tales from the Hard Side, Tales from the West Side. Proper Dose, Tales from the West Side, Flatliners, Live Evil, Flatliners, Satanic Verses, Adolf the Assassin, Ghetto Girl, Monster Voodoo Machine, Bastard Is, and Sepultura, the long-form video, Third World Chaos. And Third World Chaos, that, that video, Third World Chaos, kind of financed the beginning of White Devil. Yep. Oh, hey, Sid, are you with us now? Well, you know, Drew, I said a certain time earlier, Oh, listen, and, I'm so, listen, I'm sorry if I, I'm sorry if uh, things weren't on schedule hey, for you, sweetheart. Well, hey, no one's paying for my band practice except me and the guy. So listen, you know. your friggin' band can fucking wait, dude. Nah. <laughs> hey, Drew, you want to pay me 25 bucks for that? Or one, one, one of the supporters could give you All right, me listen, bucks? help me help you. Uh, tilt the yeah, camera. Yeah, help me help you. Exactly, <laughs> Drew. Put your face on camera, bro. You're, you're yeah. Chopping your head off there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Okay. All right. So here we go. Um, Paris, let's do let's do record of the week with album of the week with Sid the Kid, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Here he is. After I called them and sent text to him live from Astoria Soundworks Studio. Exactly. Sid the Kid, album of the week. Bam. Boom. All right. Go All ahead, righty, guys. Sid. So, hey, I'm gonna do this as quick as I can, but you know, very articulate as I do this. So, you know, when you think of landmark hardcore albums. You know, this gender, which one can you not think of? But obviously this one, you know, and obviously this is the second Bad Brains LP entitled Rock for Light. And, you know, it was recorded in, I believe, early 1983 at Synchro Sound Studios in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and was later released on, I believe, April 15th of the same year uh, on Passport Records, if I'm not mistaken. And then was re-released back in uh, later in 91 by Caroline Records. Now, for those who don't really realize this, the producer itself, you wouldn't think, who the fuck is this guy until you know who it is? And that's Rick Kosaic, uh, who's the uh, lead singer of the Cars. And you would think, you know, how the hell would this even be a thing? But it happened. Now, you know, compared to the last album, it really did incorporate, you know, that's last cool. album obviously was all hardcore and reggae. And this was the last album to do that before they started going on the soul funk and metal tip, which was I Against I. 
you know, for this record being, you know, what it was, you know, I believe, and not to say anything bad about the record, I believe it could have been better. It's a good record overall, but I think it just, it, something between that first and second record where something was slightly missing from it, you know, in my opinion. But, I mean, a lot, a lot of the songs, too, that were re-recorded for some reason or another, I don't know why they did it. I thought they, you know, they were such a songwriting duo between Doc and Daryl. They could write anything under the sun, and it comes out gold. But again, with uh, with how Rick uh, basically approached the record, it was definitely not, I believe, as bassy. It was definitely supersonic speed fast at the time, which a lot of people didn't even see that one coming, even though they knew how fast this band was live. Um, you know, saying saying that being said, though, you know, it is a good record, but honestly, in my opinion, it could have been a better record. How Rick, uh, how Rick produced it back then. All right. Hey, Paris, you want to rip this thing first or should I? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I have a lot of feelings about this record. When it came along, it was kind of like old news. Yeah. I mean, the Joshua song, um, I and I Survive, and uh, uh, those songs we already knew from an EP that had been out for a while, and they're stellar songs. Um, the, 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 I would I would own the record I would own the record solely for um, Riot Squad, uh, the Meek Shall Inherit the Earth, and Rally Round Jaw Throne. Those were the only things that came off fresh and new. All exactly. The, all the songs that were from the demo, uh, from the Roar cassette, the production is is horrible, and um, they're like like Sid said, they were played really fast. And I'd seen the Bad Brain so many times play those songs so much better. It just seemed like, you know, everybody every time you go into the studio, it's a roll of the dice. It could be a magic day yeah. or it could not be. And once it's down, it's there forever. Um, I personally would not want to ever live without this album just for those songs that I've mentioned because they're spectacular. But I couldn't help but feeling a disappointment on the songs that I already knew and loved in the form that they were already were. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I feel I feel very much the same way is, well, first off, the whole Rick Ocasek thing really threw, threw me and a couple other people off because I was up in Boston in the early 80s and we hated Rick Ocasek. Like he represented everything that like we hated in music because I was a hardcore teenager up there, skinhead kid, and the cars... It was like the cars, the cars, and like we hated the cars. Now, now I, I can now I can appreciate the cars now, of course. But you know, as a teenager, he was the antichrist. And I was at the show at Jumpin' Jack Flash that the Bad Brains played when Rick Ocasek walked in, and, and and I saw him, and we were like, "What the fuck is going on?" And then next thing you know, they're in the studio recording, and th that that was a throw off. And I think this record was like. Um, the speed on it, I think, was off. I think it, it, maybe somebody out there uh, knows about this, but I think the first pressing or something, they actually speeded it up. It didn't sound right. And uh, th that was that was part of it. And I agree. A lot of these songs were sort of, I kind of been there and done that. Uh, one song you didn't mention, which could be my all-time favorite Bad Brain song is on this, which is At The Movies. I, I love that song, At The Movies. But... Um, this but I also, I, I also couldn't help feeling that the songs that I do in, embrace, like Riot Squad and at the movies, if I feel that way about the songs that were recorded previously, and, I, and I'm in love with these songs on here, imagine how good they would have sounded yeah. if been on, with a proper production. But again, it's, it's hard to wave your finger at, at the flaws of them, you know, because a lot of times fans are the sum of their flaws, like the Black yep. Sabbath albums being all out of tune and mm -hmm. things like that. People love them. Maybe that's part of what made, made people love them. I don't know. I just know uh, that he was disappointed. Not, to me, it's like if you're going to re-record those songs, they better be way better. Yeah, exactly. And, and you and you and you would think and you would think that would be the case, um, but that would be the case in there in in what was it called? Synchro Sound with Rick Rick Ocasek. I think in the end, it's just a testament uh, uh, to to Jerry Williams, man, to J. W. Lee and, and and what he did in what seven. Oh one yeah, day, right. And I and mean, that in that little in that little basement of what he could do with what he had on that first out on that first release it's it's like trying to catch lightning in a bottle twice in my opinion 
And as, as Paris said, like those three songs he mentioned, they're amazing. And I mean, you know, seeing them live, you know, obviously decades or actually no, like in 86, they played the Ritz and they played, they played Riot Squad. They played at the movies. It was like, it was kind of weird to see them live even back in 86. And when this record came out, like a few months later, they broke up. If, if I'm not mistaken, I think later, like in 80, or was it 82 or 83, they did the, their like their farewell shows at CBGB's. You don't remake The Godfather with Tom Hanks. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Right on, brother. That's not, that's not, that's, I mean, that's no reflection on the, the, on the Bad Brains. I love them. They're the greatest. Yeah. But, uh, you know. But also, I mean, album. Sid, it is. And, and Sid, you're referencing The Bad Brains in 85. I mean, Paris and I, um, you know, were seeing The Bad Brains in 81, uh, you know, and that's sort of our reference point. Like yeah. some of those incredible shows that, and, but, but, I'm not, and you know, I'm not one of those people who's, oh, back in the day. Da, 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 but see, that. but I think, but all three of us, so in, in one sense or another, Drew and Paris, like the one thing about them between 1980 and even, dare I say, up to 87, 88, there were, that band live was so fucking sick. They mm -hmm. brought that every show. Yeah. Every, well, especially every New York show they played, they played when they played Ritz, Irving Plaza. We saw, CBs. We saw they always brought their A game every show. I remember Paris. I remember one more thing I had to add because it's on that same note is that yeah. even before the demo, even before the tape came out, we saw them so often, yeah, so weekly on a weekly basis that the songs lived for us live. That's the way I always imagined them. You know, I knew all the songs, never had any recordings, and I remember the first time I heard on Noise the show, I da -da 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 -da, coming through the speakers because I used to listen to that show. While my mom, you know, made dinner, and we'd listen to Noise the Show, and I heard that song, and I ran out and I bought that tape, and I loved it, and I loved it for years, and I still love it. Um, it's it's just that you know that imprint on me was so powerful that I guess I reject anything else. It, but the thing that's great is that people who got that record, this record, who never heard the tape or you know are are new to hardcore music, they get it and they love it and they. They have it's the same thing with Age of Coral, you know. People love to say they love the demo, but the you know the album is just different. Yeah, but, but it, I would always want, I always have to have that album in my record collection just so I can listen to, you know, Rally Around Jaw Throne and, and those songs I mentioned because they're just the fucking best. I mean, it, it's funny that it's funny to criticize a band like the Bad Runs like this because it's like you know it's like picking fleas off an elephant, you know. It's like. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. every every noticing. Most bands though here and there will have like that one blemish record. Yeah, Not I wouldn't. Band, I wouldn't consider this like a big blemish. This, no, this, it's, this, it's this, they have other. They have other blemishes later on. But yeah, this, this record but, just. I just remember, like Paris said, when this came out, it was you come, you know, so excited about it, and it was just sort of like, why are they re-recording all these songs again, and they're not as don't sound as great. And also, if I remember correctly, the, the there's a couple of songs on there um, that they released first as like a 12 inch, like the the, the first, and like we were stoked, yeah, you know, like Joshua's song. Yeah, but those like, were that wasn't connected to this record. Those those those, those that was a whole other thing. That was and before yeah, this. That, that was before this, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember that. I have that. And I, yeah, and I remember that being like, wow. They but I think it was also during that era where the Bad Brains were drifting away from playing rock music, and I guess to them it was just kind of like this is our opportunity to do this recording with Rico Casey. I guess we'll do this. Nuts, yeah. But you know what? I, you know what bothered me that they never did a proper reggae album because I love yeah. Meek Shell and Hera and Rally Round Jaw. I mean, yeah. Rally Round Jaw Throne is is just as good a Bad Brains song. We as love it. that stuff, man. Hey Sid, well done, buddy. Thank you. All right, and you know, I'm not trying to be like the biggest butthole, true, but like I said, you know, time is money. We all have to do our thing, you know. Help me help you. <laughs> help me help you. All right. And, pa so and Paris, thank you. And thank you for being on the show too, Paris. Like, you know, you were one of the white whales that we, that we try to get on the show. And it took <laughs> it took 149 other episodes for this to happen. All right, Sid. I'll talk to you later. All right. Cheers. All right. Greetings. This is Captain Ahab. Welcome to the <laughs> welcome to the New York. Heart. So, all right. Let's get back to let's get back on this. And this was this was shot at 3G stage, where uh, this is uh, I believe this this is the second project we did together. And this, of course, is Biohazard Punishment. And 
the way I, I remember it is there was a year or two or whatever in between the nuclear assault video and uh, you and I had a conversation. You said, there's this band that's asking me to do their video, um, Biohazard. Um, do you want to produce it? And then we we did this 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 punishment video, which turned out to be another very iconic video. Any memories of the of the formulation of this? I mean, I have tons of memories of, of it, especially looking at this picture and seeing all the, these guys. You know, you, you're looking at this picture this represents kind of like New York's hardest. But like all those guys, every single one of them, the entire day had smiles on their faces. It was just like, it was just like a bunch of kids in the candy store having a great time. And, you know, every time we would set up a shot, I remember we were like setting up that shot with Evan where he's like wrapping down to the camera uh -huh. and so I was like way in the back. And, you know, you know, it was crowded around with, for me, it was just faces I didn't know. And I like remember walking around the crowd and like grabbing Saab by the shirt and like pulling, he was like, what's going on? And I just pushed him like right, put him in right next to Evan. And he was just like, big smile on his face. I actually joking. remember that. I actually yeah. remember that. I remember like, you taking, oh, I remember you taking so people, much. I remember <laughs> you taking people and, and placing them in front of the camera lens. I, I actually remember that. He was like, yeah. oh, yes, thank you. He like, he said my name with a W instead and, of only ours. And, I, and I think one thing that, that really, um, happened from, from that came out of this is pretty much every one of these guys in this photograph here which is a production shot uh that 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 we did at 3g stage and you know you and me are in the front with bobby and that's tommy on the left and then roger Mered and billy danny evan uh narc on the right uh beer truck on the next row on the left and rand minus Isaac. Big John, Freddie Madball, Zowie's up there next to next to Saab, next to Kevin Bulldoze. I think after seeing the success that Biohazard is having, many, many, many of these people were inspired to go out and get a band together. Yeah, they saw the possibilities that day. Yeah, definitely demonstrated probably to somebody because I understand that position. You know, like I said, when I was sitting in my kitchen writing those songs. I had no idea of the, the you know, I, I didn't have, and I didn't see, I couldn't see the end in sight, but these guys had a window into something that they all, they, they realized, oh shit, you know, if these guys can do it, maybe we can. Yeah. And I completely understand that. Cause I, I've had moments like that. Even the, when we were shooting the nuclear assault video, I remember standing there, you know, looking around, you know, like you had, you know, you had me write down my ideas on a piece of paper and then I handed you the ideas and then, you do the budget and the next thing you know, you tell me, okay, we're going to show up to this warehouse on this day. And we show up and you had this crew of people there, you know, cameras and cranes and all kinds of shit. And I remember standing there looking, thinking to myself, wow, like this could be my life doing this. And here we are, you know, we had, we, I'm about to start an ABC television show. We had and a nice run. We had a nice run. And, uh, incredible career that you've had. You know, you just reminded me of something and I would have forgot about it. But remember how we used to go and scout these friggin' locations? And, and they always smelled like piss. They always, and they always smelled like piss and human feces. And when we, it got to the point that when we would go scout it, we'd be like, yeah. This, this is, is it. This <laughs> is it. <laughs> this is Cortland it. Alley, this oh, is it. God. So I, I found, you're going to friggin' I found this so deep in my archives, bro. So deep in my archives. I found this today. Um, I knew it was in there. I, I dug it out. But this is a clip of you and me and, and Chris Bazzani that used to work with us. And it looks like I spoke Rob, to Chris a week ago. And I think you see Rob, who drummed for uh, Law and Order, Rob, uh, in this. And we're scouting locations, right? And, and the clip, the clip is labeled pigeon shit stalagmite, right? And this is a typical kind of place that 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 we would that that we would be um, scouting. So it's it's a short clip, but get but it but get a load of this. Where the fuck is it? Hold on. Uh, uh, uh. 
Oh, it's not biting it. Damn. Well, I, was, I was worried about your library of endless videos, thinking that maybe that night that Billy Grazi Day was dragging me down a hallway of a hotel by my ankles. <laughs> <laughs> it locked me in a hotel room. Was that was that was that when we went upstate to see Pantera or something? Yes. I remember we that. Great, we went to Great Adventure with Dime. Oh God. Why? What? Hold on. I'm trying to I'm trying to line this thing up. I, I should have uh I thought it was okay. Hold on. Pigeon shit stalagmite. Where are you? Um here you go. I remember scouting that, but did we actually shoot there? Look, <laughs> look, it's Rob Bizzotti. You, you're, you're on the. No, I don't think we we didn't shoot there, but uh, but I think yes, we might have. Hold on. I just remember being like, "This is really cool," but how are we going to shoot here? That's not the Sugar Factory in Brooklyn, is it? I don't, I don't think so. I, I think for some reason, why do I think that this is upstairs from where we shot Biohazard Tales from the Hard Side? Was isn't it like that, up? Isn't that maybe, the sugar factory in Brooklyn? No, no. We shot Biohazard Tales from the Hard Side in that old Con Ed plant in Long Island City. Oh, okay. And I think that was like up in the upper, upper, upper part of it. Mm -hmm. And we ended up shooting in the lower. But, but it just made me laugh. It, it, just, it just made me laugh how we when we used to go scouting and we would, we would just shoot in the most friggin disgusting places man brutal brutal disgusting places I mean, um, when we were doing the insane clown posse video in detroit yeah. and uh, we we're like in this you know disgusting factory warehouse and you know there are lights everywhere and cameras and cranes and clowns and all kinds of shit and the next thing you know the police are surrounding the place and they swarm in and they guns drawn, and I was standing, you know, kind of towards the back by a pillar. And when the cops came in, I just like ducked behind this pillar. And they were like, everybody down on the floor. And all I kept thinking was, I'm wearing white. I'm not I'm not getting on the ground. Like I was wearing white shorts and a white t-shirt. So I just hid behind this pole. And I all I could hear was you going, We're not a gang. There's gang activity in this neighborhood. You were like, How many gangs have lights? <laughs> I mean, this is, you're lying on the ground looking up at the cop going, gangs don't have lights and cameras. And they they all came out with their guns drawn. And we and, you got them calm down. I, I stood up and came out from behind the pillar. And, and this was in Detroit. This We shot this in Detroit. Right. Do you remember? Do you, do I, do you remember when they, when the label got in touch with us and they sent us like the press pack of the music and like, I remember calling you and being like, yo, bro, you're not going to believe this. Like, they're a bunch of rapping clowns. And, like, we, we, we looked at it. We were, like, we were dumbfounded by this. We were like, what is this? And then, and then we found out that they had a budget, like a decent budget to do that. We were like, cool, all right, bet. And they were and serious the, business people. And the best part about doing the video with them was being able to say, all right, you clowns, let's go. <laughs> That was the best I remember, part. I remember when we set up the first shot and we had like, you know, two, 200, 300 kids that were dressed like clowns in the place. And they did the first take. And when the take was over, I had this bullhorn. I was like, okay, guys. Blah, 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 blah. And, and I, they go running off into the backstage area. And, and like their clown representative who was standing out there was kind of like their spokesman. I said, where'd they go? I got to talk to him. I'm, I'm going to have to talk. He goes, you have to go backstage if you want to talk to him. I said, what are you talking about? We're going to do this a hundred times. I need to talk to him every time we finish a take and he goes he goes listen man if you want to talk just come back and talk to them so i go into the backstage area you you and i both and we go into this dressing room and i go listen man you know after every take i need to talk to you and he goes he goes oh we'll take any direction you give us but you have to come up here and i said why what are you talking about he goes he goes we can't we can't take direction from you in front of the fans i said why not he goes cuz we're insane clowns <laughs> And I said, what? He goes, he goes, Paris, listen, if we weren't doing this, we'd be working at McDonald's, but we have a shot here. He goes, you can, you look out there. 
there's there's 5,000 people online to get in here. We announced this show yesterday. He goes, we have one shot. And if this shot doesn't work, we work at McDonald's. So we are never, ever going to break character. So I respect you. I will listen to everything you have to say, but you have to say it to me in private. And I went, wow, I can't really argue with that. I remember this. I remember it a little differently. I, I, the way my version of it is that I remember getting into an argument with the main clown and he got my face and said, listen, motherfucker, I'm the one that's going to end up having to work in McDonald's again if this shit doesn't work out. Now, mm. that's now it's it could have been like that. It, it, it could have been a combination of but but I, I, I actually, remember him getting aggro about it. I thought he was like uh, I thought he was very. You know, I thought he was just laying it out, but I guess he I remember we were blown away by their organization. They, yeah. they were the first band I saw that ever bootlegged their own stuff. They like they signed a record deal. The, the, the label put out the record. They got their hands on a record and made copies of their own and sold their own copies at the shows, circumventing the label. And at the video shoot, they had a merch table set up with like 50 different t-shirts. It was insane. You know, going, what the it was heck? insane, Cloud. And they, were, and they were buying them hand over fist. And remember, he had like a girl clown stalker. Yeah. <laughs> and she was, he goes, you'll see her. She's all in purple. She looks like a big berry. She looks like a Veruca Salt from uh, from, <laughs> from Willy Wonka. From, from uh, Willy Wonka. And then we yeah. finally saw her. He goes, there she is. That was in Detroit, right? At the State Theater in Detroit, we shot that. How about, let's talk about this a little bit. Now, um, I want to say, and I have, a vivid, I, have a, I have a vivid memory, you were the first person that ever um, exposed me to carnivore. I remember you were the first person, um, I don't know, I, 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 it must have been maybe when we were gearing up to do this, but I remember carnivore was on your turntable, and it was like nonstop. You were the first person I ever knew that that like really listened to Carnivore and 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 was like, this no, this is a great band. Yeah, <laughs> and I still feel that way. Yeah. And then um, of course, we went and did the typo negative black number one video. Uh here you are um with a an early steady cam rig. Is that safe to say? That's a pretty early rig, right? Yeah, that's an early one. Yeah. And I've never seen this picture before, before you sent it to me today. Oh, I've never seen this. It was one of Greg Smith's pictures. Yeah. And that and, in the tree is, is also Tommy Dietz, who was in the nuclear assault video. Ah. But that he was younger then. Actually, no, that doesn't make any sense. Who is that? Who is No, that? it was the guys from Life of Agony. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Rob Buckley's little brother. Oh, I thought, I thought weren't the guys from Life of Agony up in the tree? They are, but that kid in the mask. That kid right Rob, there? Yeah, Rob Buckley's yeah. brother. Now, I remember, you know, you were really excited to work with Pete Steele. Um, mm. You know, there's a whole, you know, we could go on for an hour about that shoot that we did at Bethesda Fountain um, and, and that whole scenario. But um, you sent me this picture too. And there was always, well, here, this is, well, we'll get to that. But um, this here is you sort of, you know, what's this, right? <laughs> now. That is, we, okay, go ahead. Now, I think we always sort of had at the end of a shoot, we took a picture and it was like thumbs up or thumbs down or it was like. Thumbs up like this. And, we, and, and yeah. And 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 we really we really struggled with this one. Um, Sunrise on Central Park. It was all over. You were like, let's take the picture. I didn't even want to take the picture. I was so, you know, this was this was the picture. And and I sent you this because a couple of years ago, me and my wife were, you know, we just turned on VH1, which we never do, but they were having this countdown uh -huh. of top 100 rock videos, uh, viewers' choice, which is a big is that, deal. Viewers' is that choice. Right? And it was on all weekend. It started Friday and it ended on Sunday night. So we just left the TV on because they were playing all these cool old rock videos, Alice in Chains and Stone Temple Pilots, shit you don't see anymore. Right, right. And on Sunday night, we, we, we had the TV on and they were doing the countdown. They were like at number nine. We were like, oh, let's, let's watch the, the countdown and see, you know, watch some more great rock videos. And when they got to number two, I was kind of astonished 
to see that the viewer's choice, number two rock video of all time, was typo negative black number one, second only to Bon Jovi living on a prayer. Wow. <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong. They hated the video when we did it. No, you can't say they hated the video because okay. we delivered the first edit. Uh -huh. And uh, God, I wish I had saved this tape because, you know, it, it never occurred to me to save something like that because Pete was my friend. He was just somebody who was my friend. Right. So when he leaves a message on my answer machine, I don't think I need to save this thing. But when he saw the rough cut, you know, I just hear this voice rumbling in the answering machine, you know, the tape saying, it's like Paris, I just finished watching the first edit. He goes, and he goes, I don't even know what to say to you, except for that I feel gratitude. He goes that I always push, you know, I always play like the band is a joke to me, but the band is not a joke to me and the band's not a joke to you. And you said to me, trust me, Pete, let me show people how I see you. And he goes, and now I see how you see me and I can't believe it. And I just have to thank you. And then he hung up. So Pete certainly loved the video and was very grateful. Mm -hmm. But subsequent to that first edit came in band politics and people arguing in the band. They started doing the silly things that bands do and counting the shots and oh. saying, like, Pete's in the shot 36 times and I'm only in 20 shots. Why is that? You know, and it became this ongoing battle. And then those same members who were, you know, because I wouldn't put in more shots of them, um, began making ridiculous demands, you know, just to like, you know, throw monkey wrench in the thing. And Case Vessels, the, the guy who owned the label said, gave us, you know, artistic freedom and allowed us to not make any changes at all. But I still contacted Pete and I said, you know, you give me a list of the changes you want and I will do everything I can to make them happen. And he gave me a list of 10 changes and I made seven, I believe. And, uh, and we talked about those seven changes and, uh, I, and, you know, I didn't have to make any of the changes, but I did, you know, and, and we did all kinds of stuff. You know, you, you allow, you asked the entire crew to work two days for the price of one, which was a tremendous favor. The favor was to you. And of course, Ben, Typo negative benefited from well, it. Well, and, 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 and also because it was, it, you had such a passion for this. This was someone that you, like, I, look, I was along for the ride in a certain way. You were so passionate about working with this artist that, you know, yeah, sure, I'm in. Let's let's make it happen. Yeah. And we both and we both forfeited our, our fees. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. We forfeited yeah, was the fees so to go into the job. Oh. The green eye visual effects you talked Mitch Brody into doing these right. days, that's not a big deal. But right. that was like a four thousand dollar effect back then. Yeah. You know, and we went over budget. Right. Uh, we won't even get into that. But wow, was, thanks, you know, thanks for giving all, me back some of my memories. <laughs> hey, you know, all in all, I'm, I'm very proud of that video. I'm, I'm very proud that I played a role in elevating typo negative to being viewed the way I saw them. You did. And participated in them becoming a multi platinum group and Pete being able to quit his job at the parks department and go on tour and become, you know, the rock star I always envisioned him and hoped he would be. And, and I know I played, we played a, a part in that. And, you know, we should both be proud of that. Unfortunately, it, you know, it all ended badly. It ended my friendship with Pete and mostly because I was, you know, because of the struggle the, of the band politics. And, uh, and I always, I always thought one day we would be friends again. But then he passed away and there's nothing to be done about I it. I also remember I got into a really um, ugly argument with their manager, Ken Creedy. Ken Creedy. I, I got into a real nasty thing with him and I always regretted that. It was very unprofessional of me, but I cracked, you know, like they were they were they were pressuring us so much and we worked so hard on it and we thought it was great and they were you know, so unhappy with it. And they remember they wanted to come down to the edit. They wanted to physically come down to where we were editing. And I yeah. got into it with their manager and and said some nasty stuff to him, and uh, which I which I which I re which I regretted immediately. And you I, I regret it because he was being an asshole. Yeah, he was know. presenting he was presenting a different front to the band. He was he was quoting things that I said that I didn't say to try to create this barrier between the band and other people. You know, a lot of managers do that. They like they make it like they're the, the savior of the band and everybody else. Yes, is for sure. The only for one sure. helping. That's yeah, exactly yeah. what he was doing. And you wouldn't, you called him out on it. 
So you have, you have nothing to be embarrassed about. You didn't. <laughs> Well, I, I lost my temper in business and like that is rare. I lost my cool in business and like I I, I, I don't like to. Well, when like other people change the rules and you don't go by those rules, you're the only person in the, you, you can't be the only person in the game playing by the rules. This is, this is true. Um, let's, let's talk about, <laughs> <laughs> this is good. Let's talk about this a little bit. What's up? Amazing. What's up? And there is the, and there is the, the, the double, uh, the platinum record right there. That this, of course, is the set of Onyx Slam. And yo, this was the video that just set it off, man. This video just set it off. It was, uh, it was incredible. And this came right after Biohazard Punishment. That's right. Oh, you know what? I gotta, I gotta go back to one thing. When we were doing biohazard punishment and we were going <laughs> I, 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 and we were going across the bridge and we were doing the bridge thing, right? Our producer at the time, or was she assistant for whatever she was? Yeah. Could you I, I vaguely could you she tell that? What's that? She was the UPM. She said you can't do this. And I and and I told her, yeah, fucking watch us, right? No, she, this, this is what she goes. She goes, she goes, true. You have to, you have to stop. Someone's going to get hurt. And you looked at her and said, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the good old days. <laughs> oh, the you good old days. It's going to get hurt. Oh, the good old days of, of, uh, the golden age of music video making when, when of course people, as people still always ask, you know, you guys did that with no permits. Yeah. So crazy. I mean, it also just goes to show how different a city it is. You yeah. couldn't go up on a Brooklyn bridge now and set up a camera and try to shoot, not only just because of the cops, oh, you just be overrun by tourists, oh, but there wasn't yeah. that tourist present at that presence at that time, even. Yeah. No, forget it. I mean, that was that was. Yeah, you talk about that punishment video all day long. That was we pulled we pulled. That was magic, bro. That that was that was magic. Um, and, so, and so was this. Um, you know, somebody at Rush Management had the perspective to say, "Let's get the rock and roll white boys to do our video." That's right. It was New York. Yeah, make it dope with bitches, right? But I remember when we were shooting this, like in the middle of shooting it, I looked up and or you and I looked up from the video monitor and Russell Simmons was standing there with Brett Ratner. Do you remember that? Yeah. And, he, and you were like, what the fuck is Brett Ratner doing here? <laughs> and, and I just went up to him and I just tried to say hello. Like I always do. And Brett of course was, you know, as you know, back then was always very friendly to me. Mm -hmm. And he was like, Hey man, this looks amazing. I can't believe how great this. And I was, I was like, thanks. And I was like, Hey Russell and Russell just like ignored me. You remember that, how like he would, he would, if he had business to talk with you about, he would yeah. talk to you about it. Otherwise there was no socializing. But then I went back over to you and you were like, what are they doing here? What are they doing here? And then eventually um, Run DMC showed up and they yes. joined, they yep. joined Russell. And then Russell came up and basically was like, oh, by the way, I want you to put Run DMC in the video. And then we had them in the video. That's right. Which was cool. Now yeah, that, that that well, well, it all tie it all ties together here because you know the the biohazard guys were in the Onyx video, you know the Run DMC guys were in the Onyx video. Then we went and did you know the, the it all was it was all very incestuous. You know, Rick the Rick the biohazard video led us into the Onyx video, which led us into the Run DMC video, which led us into another biohazard video and another Onyx video, and it was it was very incestuous. And this part here. Do you remember where we shot this? Yeah, in LA, uh, you know, in South Central. Yeah, in South Central LA. Or was it Compton? Uh, I don't know. E either or. But I just yeah. knew whatever bandanas they were wearing, they were warned to take them off. Right. Right. Absolutely. There were a bunch of people there that day. Ezek was there that day. Yeah, and to to Toby, Ezek. Um, Remember, we put Boss in the video. That that artist, Boss, That's getting right. out of the right. Let me see what. She was a good-looking girl. I don't know what happened to her. Yeah, she had. She was one. She was one and done. You yeah. know, did that. Did that one record, and then, like I said, um, 
you know, after we did Onyx Slam, we did Onyx Shifty, right? That was that was a good one. I definitely didn't give you that picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of these are pretty pretty weird. I'm wearing my I'm rocking my Biohazard sock hat, you know. I I liked that video way more than I liked Slam, but you know, as you know, it never got played. Yeah. Do you remember when we had the meeting with them and Sticky Fingers was like, and at the end of the video, we want to get into a spaceship and fly away. I don't remember that part, but at the <laughs> meeting, he said um, uh, he was sitting right across me at the table. He goes, he goes, if you're going to direct this video, I need there to be a white family trying to get their son to eat pork. I remember that. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, there's going to be a little white boy, and he's going to have an onyx tattoo, and his parents are going to try to serve him pork, and he's just going to say no. And Russell Simmons, I mean, you know, Russell Simmons is sitting at the table, and Leo is sitting there, and they're all like, huh? And I said, I can do that. Because to me, at the time, I remember thinking to myself, well, that's cool. I get to shoot a scene with actors and block a scene, you know, to uh -huh. have a narrative thing, because I never did anything. I just did music videos. So we wrote it into the treatment. He, I said, and you said, okay, that's a budget for a whole nother day. The budget went up and, and you called the casting. We hired a mom and pop and a little kid. And we got the little tattoo made. We shot the whole thing. We edited it. It was at the beginning of the video. And um, we went into Def Jam and we showed them the video. And when the video was over, Russell Simmons looked at us and goes, what the fuck was that at the beginning? Go, what do you mean? He goes, the kid, the kid and the, the pig and the pork. What was that about? I said, you were at the meeting. You heard him say that he wanted that. He goes, you actually shot it? I go, yeah. What the hell you think we did? And then he said, uh, can you cut it out? I said, yeah. So we just went back into the studio and cut out the beginning. Wow. My mom texted Zom. Um, um, this is a great shot of you with the Steadicam rig. Uh, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm standing back there in my wife in my wife beater, but we 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 closed down Forty Second Street where we did this. It, it was another insane exam, example of of just how different the city was. I remember you said that we were permitted to shoot on the sidewalk, but we had towers built in the street and lights and and you know there must have been 150 kids out there to, to emulate a riot. And I remember we were just about to do take one. And the cops walked up and said, you guys have to stop. And you just looked, you just looked at the, you just looked up and you said, roll camera. Roll camera. <laughs> and we just, and, and and all the kids just started running around like yep. crazy. So at least we would get that one crazy scene. And we got it. And we got it. But, 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 but if I remember what happened was Onyx was on some radio show, like that morning or the day before, and they announced that we're shooting the video on 42nd street between 7th and 8th Avenue and everyone should come down. Yeah. And it was a mob scene. It was, it was, it was great. We, we managed to compartmentalize all the shots in small, like close ups and like we just saw. And we yeah. were on the sidewalk for yeah. the majority of the shoot and the cops didn't shut us down. It was only when we tried to do this big wide riot shot. Yeah. 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 And I guess we only needed one take. And then remember when we did the first cut of the video, MTV was not having it. Cause, cause it was it, right after the riots. It was after it was on the cusp of the LA riots. They weren't and having it. And we got a video with Ryan in it. We had to fucking we did a re-edit that did cut the balls off that video. Yeah. It was still great though. It, it, it was still great. Um, and like I said, one thing leads to another, it leads to another. And soon after we were doing this run DMC video. That's and right. and and I remember a funny story about, about this, that we, we went into a meeting um, with Run DMC. And, and I, Russell and Lior. What's that? And Russell and Lior. And we had this pitch, because I have a, wait, I have a picture. Wait, I think I have the picture somewhere. Oh, the, 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 Met, the Shea Stadium thing. Yo, right on, man. Wait, do I have that picture? Oh, because we went and scouted Shea Stadium. Yeah, I have a. We photo. stood on the pictures mountain. And everything, was really bro. Cool. You're not gonna believe this. I got the picture. Huh? Hold on. Look, I have the freaking picture from the scout. I didn't even think of this. That is great. 
I, I remember thinking, like, you don't even really want to shoot there. You just want to stand on the field. <laughs> uh, where is – here it is. So, so you and I, we go scouting, and we go to Shea Stadium, right? You took this picture. I didn't even think of this until just now. You, you took this picture of, of, <laughs> of me at home base, right, at Shea Stadium. Yeah. And we're thinking, okay, run DMC – from Queens, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have, like, run on one side of the plate and DMC on the other side of the plate, right? And we're going to have them both, you know, rapping, rapping over each other, right? And, and we go to this meeting, and we, we, do the big, we do the big pitch. At Time Cafe. Is that where it was? Yeah. Well, let, me, let me find that other – let me find the run DMC picture because we need the visual here. Okay, I got it. And I go through this whole big, you know, impassioned presentation. Like, in the fucking sense of Uzava. And I remember Jam Master J looks at me like, like, what are you talking about? He goes, we want, we want, we want niggas eating chicken and playing basketball. And you and me looked at each other and went, yeah. We could do that. We could do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's what turned into this in Hollis Park. It was like, okay, yeah, let's do that. Basketball, chicken, like, great. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> that was a great time. Well, I you remember the, fir the first night, the first day got washed out, right? Yeah. And looking back on it, I remember <clears> – <throat> We're like, we're there. The whole crew's there. Run DMC is there. The water's coming down. You and I were like standing under an overhang. And you're looking at me and you're just like, so Paris, <laughs> there's really nothing you can shoot right now. And I go, well, not what we planned. So if we shoot everything now, are you going to tell me we're going to come back tomorrow and shoot what I wanted? And you were like, no, we can only shoot for one day. And so I stuck to my guns and I was like, no, but like looking back in retrospect, we should have just shot that night. But ultimately the video was what but we wanted. came, but we came back strong. We came back the next day and we killed it. Yes, we did. And you know, do you remember, I don't know if you remember when, 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 when I almost got arrested that day. No. Yeah. We showed up at Hollis park and we got a bunch of people there and the bathroom is locked, right? The public bathroom's locked. And it's what was his name? Huh? It's coming back to me. And what was the dude's name who did the lightning for us? Bzz, Scott, Scott something. Remember that dude? He was like our main lightning dude. Bzz, bzz, that oh, dude. Uh, yeah, yeah. He was uh, like a crane, the crane dude. The crane dude, lightning. No. No, the crane dude was Scotty Butler. That's, Butler. that's it. Scotty Butler. He said, the, 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 he's like, he's like, yo, I got clippers. I got clippers. I got, you know, clippers in the truck that could clip that lock. And I go, do it. And he clip and he clips the lock, right? Cops show up, right? We had 150 people in the park and no bathroom, right? People started to piss, like piss at the, in the corner. And I'm like, yo, that's good. So I sort of weighed. I said, yo, cut the lock. Cops showed up and they say, who cut the lock? We want to know who cut the lock. And I said, look, I didn't cut the lock, but I cut the lock. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, like I didn't physic, I didn't do it. But, yo, I, I'll take the fall for it. And they were going to arrest me until they realized that if they arrested me, they would probably have a riot on their hands. Right. And it was like mutually assured destruction. They, they, they didn't, they didn't uh, you know, they didn't do it, you know. The Run DMC song that, that we did was called Ooh, What You Gonna Do. It's on, uh, the, rec it's on the album Down With The King. Yeah. Ooh, What You Gonna Do on Down With The King. Correct. Bad luck, Brett. Never let a punk get away with murder. Gunshots, gunshots, all you heard. That was awesome. That was great. Um, <laughs> so, it's amazing how you don't forget the words to any of the songs that we did videos for. Well, listen. Like, remember Mitch Brody would always be like doing slam for <laughs> 10 videos along. He's like, I can't stop singing it. Listen, you know, I got to say that, you know, you had an incredible work ethic back then. And you and Mitch Brody sat in those edit rooms day after day after day. And I'd come in and how's it going? 
you know, and, and get you guys lunch or, or whatever. And every video ended the same way with me, you and me arguing and me saying, there's no more money. I'm pulling the plug. Yeah. <laughs> and then, no, I, your line was, it's just a music video. It's only a music video. You, you would say that at the end of every video. And I was just like, <laughs> but, but I must say that when we did slam, you know, we always had that allotted five days or whatever it was to edit. I believe it was five days. I remember getting to the end of the fifth day and you came in and I just looked at you and I said, Drew, this is the one. You got to give me another day. You have to give me another day. And you did. And it made all the difference. That's awesome. Yeah. And that was, you were right. That was the one. Because after we did that, the phone just started ringing. It was like, rang, rang, rang. rang. It was like, we, we, we went, we did this, we did that. Um, you know, look at what else I have here. Well, this is, this is a great shot here. I mean, we, we, let's not go down this rabbit hole again. Let's not go down this rabbit hole, but here's a great shot. From, Thanks, Larry. What's that? Larry says, great imitation of Drew. And I was like. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, when we did Biohazard uh, Tales from the Hard Side, right? Yeah, that, and, was, uh, great, that was another great experience. Yeah. That was great. Greg, Greg Smith. Greg Smith up on top. Yo, how about that cell phone I got in my hand, huh? Right out of Star Trek. <laughs> Scotty, <laughs> beat me up. I think I think I saw this picture re recently. We were talking about the girl from Warner Brothers. That's her up in the right. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember her name, but she was the music video commissioner from Warner Brothers. Yeah, she was real cool. Yeah. But so, that was a great, I love that. That was right before we shot the scene with Bobby the Handball's mom and and going back in your neighborhood, the color yeah. of your skin. She was great. She was All great. Bobby, Bobby Hamble's, Bobby Hamble's, uh, Bobby Hamble's mom. Um, let's, um, you know, we're, 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 we're going deep, but let, let me take my last sponsor break and let's come back and let's, let's just take some questions from around the world. There's a lot we didn't cover, but let's, let's hear from our people. Let, let's hear some, some questions. All right. Let me take, let, let's, let me do my last sponsor break. I'll see you in a minute. Yeah. All right. Well, this is episode 150. We're taking an awesome walk down memory lane with our old friend Paris Mayhew. This, of course, being the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, sponsored by DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, Chacho's Tacos, the Texas Silver Rush, New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, and Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, located in Lakewood, Colorado, is the Rocky Mountain headquarters for all things punk, hardcore, and metal. Established in 2014, they have the largest selection of records, CDs, shirts, stickers, patches, and accessories between Chicago and Los Angeles. From the pit to the ditch, they got your back. Get in touch with them at www.chainreactionrecords.com. Come on now. Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi, Texas, represent. Chacho's Tacos opened their doors in 2001, home of the almighty Chacho's Taco. They took up an incredible homestyle Tex-Mex food, and this month they're celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've been supporting underground music since the beginning, in their own words. We ain't going anytime soon. Touring bands that play Corpus Christi swing by and get a home-cooked meal at Chacho's Tacos, we got you. The underground scene will never die. Please follow us on Facebook or on Instagram. That said, let's... Let's take some questions from around. The I think I think I got just a reminder coming up this Wednesday is um, coming up this Wednesday is <sighs> I'm drawing a blank. Um, hold on, stay with me. Handsome Dick Manitoba. Whew. Uh, then, uh, not this weekend. There's no show. I'll be out in California playing some shows. Then Brett from Ignite and TJ Hoffman, director of Roadie. Uh, then after that, Sunday, October 7th, Frank Bello. So lots of good stuff coming up. Um, what else? There's a merch. There's a merch line underneath there. If you want to buy the New York Car Court Chronicles mug or do good things, the good things will come to your shirt or something. Um, if you are, if you have a telephone, if you have a cell telephone and you're wondering, hey, I'd like to I'd like to keep abreast of what's going on with the show. Uh, Instagram. Stone at Stone Films NYC. Pick it up right now at Stone Films NYC to find the latest what's going on with the show announcements. 
Um, what else? Oh, there is a subscription button right there. Tickle, tickle, tickle. If you are watching this in rerun, please feel free to um, subscribe to the show. Thanks. Um, let's do some questions. It's question time with our guest, Paris Mayhew. So post some questions. Don't be shy, but don't be stupid either. <laughs> All right. Post up your pictures. Post up your questions. What are we? Yeah, we're an hour and 40 minutes into it. I'm getting a little punch drunk. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Um, here we go. Hey, bro. Hey, just want to mention, uh, you mentioned you're, you're going to have Frank on the show. He's a, he's a great guy. I got to know him pretty well doing a bunch of, uh, film jobs for anthrax back in the eighties. I did a music video, belly of the beast and attack of the killer bee videos. And I did their live concert film, live noise. So got to know him and those guys very well. And they were super supportive of me as a filmmaker um, in the early days, played a major role. You know, you never know uh, stuff like that. If it hadn't happened, you know, it could have been the, the, the missing piece between then and now. Things could have been very different if uh, guys like that who had a voice didn't step forward and say, I want this guy instead of somebody else. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Thanks to... Frank and Anthrax. Yeah, he's a, he's a nice guy. I'm really looking forward to ha <clears throat> having him having him on the show. Uh, let's let's uh, let's kick off with this from from uh, from Thomas Starkey. Any memories of the band White Devil playing and touring with Bobby Hamble and Harley? And I have a photo to go with that. A photo that you sent me. Hold on. Here we go. There you go. Yeah, that was in my apartment on Spring Street when we were rehearsing you know, or teaching Bobby the songs. It was, it was a great time. It was, it was, you know, after I had taken a long break from music and uh, there I was, at a, you know, again, settled into the, into the idea that I wasn't playing music anymore. And there I was with uh, an old friend, Bobby and, and Harley and Dave Vicenzo. And we were just about to go on tour and we were rehearsing in my apartment here. And uh, it was funny because we were just about to go to Europe and there was a blizzard and you couldn't even get out of my building. Ugh. But, um, and the tour was all postponed for a week or two, but uh, we ended up going out and it was, you know, it was, we were on fire for two weeks and then that was it. It was over with Bobby. I mean, and we, we you know, you know, Harley and I obviously continued and made a, the album, the White Devil album that was Revenge and uh, with Dave Desenzo as well. Was and, was he out with you for two weeks or after two weeks he faded? Uh, no, we, we toured with him for two weeks. Oh, okay. And then that was, it didn't really, we, we weren't suited for each other. Although it was spectacular. I mean, the moments on stage were just on fire. Bobby is Bobby, you know, everybody yep. knows who he is. And he was amazing. And, the, you know, we had a new batch of songs and they, and they came from, you know, just a really good musical place. I thought, you know, I, the future looked bright. It was all ahead of us. We were on the launch pad again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's all there is to say about that. All right. All right. Um, but playing with Bobby was just a weird thing. You know, it's like, he, he's just like a ball of energy. I mean, I already knew that. I knew, I've known, I've known him for years, but it was right on the cusp of him leaving biohazard. Yeah. And then it was just kind of like, we, we have a, a, a place open, you know, it seemed like there wasn't even anything to think about. It wasn't like we auditioned or anything. Me and Harley just looked at each other and we were like, Bobby. And we both went, yep. We called him. He showed yeah, up. Yeah. And, and that, that footage from Dino that year, that that's, what's really out there all these years later. If you want to see, you know, Bobby playing with you guys, it, it's really from, what was that 95? That yeah, and that and that recording at Dynamo is probably the best representation of us live I've ever seen. Like, yeah, I've never ever seen a live video of the Chromax or anything else where I was like, oh, that could be put out. I, I like that as a living legacy for our live performance. You know, if anybody ever asked to see that anything live, I always send them to that video. Got it. Um, let's let's do this. Hold on. Hey Zum, hey Zum, you with us? Yep. How How's are you, the buddy? There he is. Good man. 
New hey, York wow. City, baby. The Hi. island of Manhattan. All right, there he is. Good. Let me let me let me get the, the Sound City logo up there for you. How are you, buddy? Doing great. Paris, great Good. to see you. Good to see you too. It's been uh, not since Nam. <laughs> that's that's right. That's right. I'm at the Nam show. We're exhibiting Sound City in Fayette, and I get a text from Paris. He's like, "I'm outside. How do I get into this effing place?" And, <laughs> and five like, minutes later, I was in. I, yep, hooked it up. Let's talk a little bit. Uh, let's talk a little bit about gear um, and stuff like that. But let, let's let's kind of let's start out with this baby right here. Um, Oh well, let's see. What what is he what is he grabbing? Hey, hey, hey Paris, grab the bitch. <laughs> I know what he's getting. Grabbing something zone related. Oh, okay. All right, let's we'll we'll grab the bitch too. What, 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 we could come back we'll get to, to that. that. Oh, yeah, no, let's we'll get to that. Let's start let's start with the bitch, Paris. Now, there it is. This is like, you know, the opening scene of the first Star Trek movie. <laughs> Everybody just wanted to see the ship. This is it. Where, where did, where did, exactly. was this, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't this guitar purchased on the, on the infamous 48th Street? And, it and you bought a different, you, you initially bought a different, um, a different bitch and, it it wouldn't stay in tune. How does that story go? Well, I I had two hundred bucks and I put a down payment on this guitar. I'd gone into the store and spent like an entire day lining up guitars up against the wall. I was driving them nuts. I was like fourteen or fifteen, and I would I was I was just playing them loud and over and over again until I whittled it down to two guitars. And it was <laughs> this guitar and a wood grain version of the same model. But I couldn't see myself playing a red guitar. Well, so, let, let me let me just interject. Correct me, uh, Zum. The wood grain version of the bitch isn't that like what Joe Perry played? No, his was red. Yeah, this was red. who? But who there was. The, go ahead. There was a. They made him in maple, and they made him in koa. Right. Okay. And I think uh, Joe Perry had a mockingbird, which is a what I, I had a koa My mockingbird. Bad. My bad. Yeah. Joe okay. had a, a ten string bitch, and Brad Whitford had the wood grain bitch. That's where I remember seeing it somewhere in that Aerosmith camp, right? But I got the wood yeah. grain, like like Brad Whitford, and you know the reason I bought the bitch was because Joe Perry was on the cover of Guitar Player magazine with that red guitar, and it just had an impression on me. But for some reason, I couldn't play a red one, so I got the wood grain one, and I had it at home for a week. And I couldn't get it to stay in tune. So I decided I was going to take it back. But they had some kind of like return policy seven days, and it was the eighth day. So I went in there with my grandmother, who I used to meet for lunch. And uh, so me and her walk into this place and just wanted me to do an exchange. And I walk in, I said, listen, you know, I bought this guitar here, and it won't stay in tune. And they were like, when did you buy it? And I showed them the receipt. They go, uh, you should have brought it yesterday. You can't return it now. I said, yeah, but, but this guitar won't stay in tune. And they said, tough, kid. And my grandmother was like, you creep you. You creep you. Who do you think you're talking to? And I just, I, and I was just, you know, 15-year-old kid. And I kept thinking to myself, these motherfuckers are trying to rip me off. So I, I, I had, the guitar was on the ground and open because I was explaining to them that it was out of tune. And I reached, I reached over and I grabbed the guitar. And I picked it up like this, and I went over to a wall of Les Pauls, and I said, you are going to fucking take this guitar back, because you don't know how many guitars I will be able to destroy before you can stop me. And they put, and they gave me a new guitar. They gave me this one, the red one. And my grandmother was like, well, that's how I ended up with the red one. And, and you, and you know, I, I I played a red Jackson bass in you know the 1990-ish years in Antidote because it was the best one. It wasn't because I didn't want a red guitar with a pointy headstock, but it sounded like 
heavens open, you know, it had that piano string like nothing else. So I dealt with the red guitar too. Well, I'm very thankful that, you know, it was funny because I rushed out the door of that store, you know, feeling kind of like, oh, damn, I had to leave with the red one. I didn't get to negotiate and try something else, you know. I just grabbed the next one that was on the list, you know, and and, and it was and it's funny because I love the guitar. I've never parted with the guitar, and it's part of how people remember me. Is it safe to say that 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 is your main recording guitar? It's on all the Chromags recordings and all that. It's the only guitar I ever owned up until five years ago. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I began to collect instruments. Like I got that Fender P bass from Mary Campbell, mm -hmm. uh, the Les Paul, you know, I have that Black Beauty and I have um, a GNL Rampage downstairs, serial number 17 of 70, special run. And, uh, that, and thing, got, that, th that thing even, it, it, yo, that thing even made the cover of the Village Voice, right? It did. And I got, I got this last year, it belonged to country music star Clyde Moody, who also helped teach me how to play guitar when I was a kid. And he passed away in, uh, in 1989. And, and I always wondered what happened to this guitar. And last year, I was reaching out to some songwriters because I'm a publisher, you know, because I inherited my father's publishing company. Me and my brothers did. And um, I was reaching out trying to find these songwriters and I found this woman in the hills of Tennessee who was the only or the closest living relative I could find of Clyde Moody, who was this awesome guy who, who was a, he had the, like the first American million selling song called Shenandoah Waltz. And in his later years, he worked for my dad and he didn't really do anything. My dad just wanted to have him on payroll and keep him busy because he was Clyde Moody. Paid him a little money to hang out in our in our, the lobby of his recording studio, and he would teach me how to play guitar. And he taught me how to play guitar on that. Wow! And then he passed away in '89 while we were on tour, and I, you know, I just thought it was in bad taste to uh, ask his wife what happened to the guitar, so I just didn't think about it. But when I reached out to these songwriters last year because I was I had to find the writers to pay them off, uh, not pay them off, but to pay them what they were owed. And this one of the women that I spoke to in the hills of Tennessee was like, oh, yeah, no, I'm not the heir. You need to speak to my cousin. And he's got that guitar. I said, what guitar? I said, not the one that says Clyde Moody in the in the in the in Pearl. <laughs> she goes, yeah. She goes, I think I think he might even be looking to sell it. I said, give me his phone number right now. A week later, me and my wife Bartlin were in the hills of Tennessee at a truck stop with cash in my hand and made the exchange. And rescued the guitar. That's awesome. Tell us about that, uh, that pedal board that you grabbed. Well, initially, you know, because of Zum, back in the day when we were making the Best Wishes album, we, uh, Zum gave us the, the recommendation of using the Sans M. Now, this isn't the one I use. This is one that I got subsequently, and I actually used this on Chaos Magic. Um, and, it, and, it, and it sounded adequate. But after I told Zum that I used that on the recording, he was like, no, 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 no. It's got to look like this, and it's got to have this kind of plug and all that <laughs> yeah. kind of stuff and, and all that stuff. So I went out and I got that. But it also happened to be the same one that John, my old friend John, who plays with Stone Sour, you know, see how I wrote on the bottom here? It says Chow's bass rig. I was over at uh, Roy Mayorga's house and doing a recording, and he let me play through Chow's rig. And when it was all done, I took a picture of it and I copied the whole thing. And this is what I used on the most recent recording, CD Kids. And I must thank you, Zum, because I got to tell you, I, I summoned Chuck Dubows Dubowski on this on the latest recording. And I always think of Chuck as being like the Joe Frazier of bass. There's nothing heavier. There's nothing harder. Nobody hits better than he does. And that's what Chuck was. And I did everything I could to like kind of uh, conjure that sound, but all I did was use this guy. Thank you, Zom. I appreciate it. Mm. Yeah, man, that was it. I mean, you know, in those early days of Antidote, when I was, you know, hauling the '76 SVT, not I, Drew and I were hauling the '76 SVT. I told you this story. <laughs> I told him the story at the beginning of the show. We used to call it the Widowmaker. Yeah, the thing was the thing was like you could kill you, you could lose you can lose a limb dragging that thing around. Yeah, 
Exactly. So, um, but yeah, so the, the, the Sam Sam Face Driver DI was based on that, my rig, I had used a TC Electronics booster line driver into the SVT. I set it a certain way, whatever. And we went into the studio, Andrew Barta and I, and I played, he listened, and you know, that's how we developed it. Also, I believe, I'm not positive, but it was the first, if not one of the first um, bass pedals to ever have a blend control so it could blend in the dry signal and um it was also you know fan could run off phantom power and it really freak out sound guys because they were like if you hit that switch is my whole pa gonna blow up and we'd be like no don't worry we got you stay calm and you know now they're everywhere of course so um yeah that's cool there was one thing i wanted to ask paris i wanted to ask you about the bass playing on Chaos Chaos Magic, the the just about the string bends, about how you came up with those riffs, and just sort of like, I think a lot of bass players are um, they don't think that they, they they're allowed to bend strings like we do, and I think that um, you know a lot of bass players just you know they're like a little bit nervous to just go to 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 just wander off the root of the chord. And I just think this is really cool bass playing. And I like the way you captured in the video what you're really playing. And I just wanted to just bring that up a little bit. I appreciate it. I mean, I'm, I am a bass player first. I know most people know me as a guitarist, but I started out as a bass player. And I never stopped playing because I love the instrument. And I also love it as a, as a way of writing, you know, because to me, it's just a vehicle for my songs. But when I was, you know, I didn't have that um, preconceived idea about bending the bass strings, like you said, ba some bass players do, because I was just approaching it from a songwriting uh, position. I, I, you know, it, it stems all the way back to Black Sabbath, Iron Man, you know, bam. as soon as anybody ever heard that, they thought to themselves, how can I put that in a song without it sounding like Iron Man? And this was my way of doing that. You know, it's it put it, it's hiding it in a riff, you know, making it part of the melody. You know, lead guitarists do it all the time. They stretch into notes and stretch out of notes, but but it's rarely done in rhythms and rarely done on the bass. Um, another person who did that and did it really well was Pete Steele in Typo Negative. He used it as a melodic tool, and I certainly learned from him. I learned from Black Sabbath, and uh, that's why I do that in Chaos Magic. And I, and I love that you recognize that because, you know, even more so, I think my next song, City Kids, is a bass song, even more, more so than Chaos Magic, because it is actually broken up into two sections. One section is called City Kids, which is like the Chuck Dubowski pounding Joe Frazier bass. And then the whole second side, the whole second section, I drop my pick and I use the three finger Getty Lee uh, finger picking <laughs> technique. And it's all Getty Lee from there, you know, because I love, you know, I love my rush. So I really approach that song as a bass player. You know, to a large extent, I've always written many of this. I wrote most of the stuff on the first Chrome Mags album on the bass. You know, World Peace, all that stuff. They were their bass oriented songs because I wrote them on the bass. And I never stopped writing on the bass. And as a result, uh, Chaos Magic took the, the shape it did. It's really a bass song. That especially the rhythm once it starts going fast, it's not like it can be played kind of like that. It's got to be played like that because it's a bass song, and I know you see that. Uh, Th Thomas that. asks, um, "The video for Chaos Magic suits the music perfectly. Will there be a video for the new track City Kids?" And when and Dylan asks, "When will City Kids be released?" City Kids uh, slash Goes to New York will be released on Halloween. Nice. I've, been work, I've been working on the video off and on for a couple of months. It's one of those things where like literally I'll be just lying in bed. I'll wake up in the morning and go, that would be a good thing to do. And then I'll load up my car with all the gear and the guitar or whatever, and I'll drive to wherever I want to go and shoot it. And I set up, and it's a, it's a big task doing it all by yourself. Or, or, or and, and my wife helps me. I know that sounds funny, but it's just the two of us. And I did Chaos Magic all with one person. And we basically, you know, I put the guitar on my wife and I light her. 
and I frame up the shot and then we change places. So, you know, that's what I did with, uh, with, with, with city kids as well. The only thing that's going to be dramatically different about city kids is I wanted it to feel like it was almost the same night, you know, cause it's basically my tour of New York city nights, the New York city that I remember as, as a child. And that's why I, I call it the, the song city kids. Cause I'm certainly not a kid, but I think, I think, you know, guys like us, we only grow up the way we do because we were city kids. You know, it, it shapes the kind of adults we are, and it's a different kind of adult. And that's basically, you know, since it's instrumental, I can be as abstract as I want. But I maintain that that look of the New York City nights, but I'm also shooting quite a bit of stuff during the day um, with city kids, kids riding skateboards in a skateboard park, um, just to kind of show, you know, the faces of the next generation of city kids. Hey, Zum, I know you and I, uh, we talked uh, previously about uh, Paris's, uh, Paris and the Marshall Amps uh, and sort of back in the day. Uh, what's, your, what was your, what's your take? And we could get a comment on Paris as far as the kind of cabinets and speakers, uh, what, what, what Amps Paris was sort of known for. Well, I mean, I just know that Paris is a Marshall guy. So he can talk. I don't know what models exactly. And I know also that the recent I wrote stuff was not recorded with the bitch, I believe. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how you recorded the guitar tracks. You know, my, my bitch went through, it went, it had some problems uh, at, at the last Chromex tour, the electronics died. So when I, when, no, <laughs> yeah, literally like on stage it died. I think I played the last two shows with a, with a, like a three hundred fifty dollar guitar I borrowed from Rob. No, not the bitch. No. <laughs> and it's funny. It's one. It was one of the only. Uh, it was one of the only times in the entire tenure of Chromex that Harley paid me a compliment. After I walked off stage that first night playing this three hundred fifty dollar cheapy guitar, you know, he were standing on the side of the stage and he kind of gave me a side look and he goes, "I guess it wasn't the guitar." There you go. That was that was the big compliment. We'll but take anyway, it. Uh, we'll take the, it. That guitar ended up in a, in a in the case, and I put it in storage. It must have been there for nine years. I didn't even see the guitar for nine years. Mm. And uh, at some point, um, this guy, this, this guy that I know who's a guitar collector, um, gifted me the, this GNL Rampage, and I just started playing it all the time. And when he gave it to me, it was set up in D standard, and. Uh, so I just started playing it that way, I would, you know, because it had a locking system and all that stuff. I didn't want to go through the whole thing. I just started playing it. And that be, kind of became my main guitar. And uh, and I began playing with Cobbs. And Cobbs had a little studio in, a, in his, you know, his, in, his, in his rehearsal space. And that just happened to be the guitar I was playing at the time. And the bitch was out of commission. And I, it was actually in the shop. It was in the shop for a year trying to get fixed. Uh, and, and even then it didn't get fixed and it, it just kept going back and forth to all these different guitar techs trying to restore it to the way I wanted it to be. So I played the GNL on Chaos Magic uh, completely. I used the same amps I always did, a Marshall JCM 800, uh, two heads, uh, mic stereo, two mics for each cabinet. So we recorded the performance, you know, four times. It's a, Thing I learned from Normandy Studios, Tom Soros back in the day. It's a simpler version of Tom's. Tom's Tom would do it with like cabinets and amps all over the place. He would probably do 10 mics for each performance, but I just did <laughs> eight. And then I just doubled it. So all together there were eight tracks that were combined. And uh, and literally I played Chaos Magic live because Cobbs didn't want to punch anything. He just refused to do it. So I would go in and I would I play to a click. I mapped out the entire song to a click. I performed the entire song um, on the guitar twice, which ended up being eight tracks. And then I did the entire song on the bass. And then Cobbs played the drums to what I played. And that's that's how it's not, that's 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 how it came about. It was just kind of like that was the guitar that was at my reach. And like I mentioned to Drew earlier, you know, I didn't really have any perspective of what this recording was going to be. I didn't. I think I was going to put it out. I thought it was a demo that Cobbs and I were doing just because I wanted, you know, it was such a long, elaborate thing. And Cobbs was having a hard time getting his head around uh, the arrangement. 
So I said, if I just record it to a click, to all these varying tempos that I want, you can just play to it and you don't have to worry about me you know, floundering while you're figuring it out. And that's what happened. That makes sense. That's it. But I subsequently got the bitch back. And um, when I was recording City Kids, I had done the first initial tracks with the GNL. And the GNL is a really clean guitar. And that's why I like it for recording. Because you know you get a very you don't you don't you don't get frequencies fighting with each other. The guitar is very specific, the bass is very specific, and you get a lot of separation. When you have something like the bitch, which is like very fuzzy edged, and you and you're playing with the sand zamp, which is kind of fuzzy edged thing, and a snare drum, all the and the cymbals, all those things start to fuzz together. Yeah. You, Zom knows exactly what I'm talking. You probably know what I'm talking about too. But uh, so I initially recorded everything with the GNL, but it just didn't have the fire and the bite that I wanted. So I just brought the BC Rich to the, the studio one day and I plugged it in and I was like, what the fuck have I been thinking? It sounded so much better. Mm -hmm. So the next track is going to have, is, is primarily the bitch in the Gmail. But that's also good to have, you know, you know, the Doug Holland, Paris Mayhew sound is like two different, two different yeah. things that, that, that accompany each other and, and complement each other. That was the thing that was great about me and Doug. We were very different players, very different sound. I tried to, you know, bring Doug with me, in a, at least in theory. Makes sense. Zum, yeah, you got anything? You, you got anything else for Paris? What do you, Zum? What's going on with you? Give us a Zum update, like a quick. What's going on with with Fryette and Sound City? Give us a give us the Zum update. So the quick update is, um, so there's a lot of people that have been the that you a lot of different bands that were going to go on tour. Tours were canceled. You know all of that. Uh, Helmet was going to go on tour, do a club tour, and that got canceled. But now they book for next year for Europe and stuff like that. But um, the most recent thing was Quicksand. So um, Stephen Brodsky from Cave In and Mutoid Man and Old Man Bloom and a bunch of other bands uh, just happened to mention that he was going to jump on the Quicksand tour as their you know, lead guitar player, second guitar player. So uh, he's already using our stuff. So I went out to their rehearsal last week and I brought him the new uh, Fryat Deliverance 2 120 head. And, it, and he's using the Sound City 412 cab. So it worked out perfectly because on the new Deliverance head, there's two master there's a solo master volume that's foot switchable so he just gets to click a foot switch and it just gives him a lead boost but it's not the same as like putting a boost pedal in front of the amp it it's actually what a does separate it do? master it just, what does it do is it just it does more than just kick up the volume right in the way he has it set it just go gets it just another master volume that just set louder yeah, so right. it's just it makes just the amp louder for leads okay Right. Uh, and when he's in the lower mode and he drops the volume down on the guitar, it just cleans up like that. So he's not a sort of idea for a while, you know, people were like really into three channel amps that they were thinking, you know, clean, crunch, lead. But the idea of the deliverance is it's a single channel amp really that you can work with the pickups and the volume and, and go through a different amount of gain structure. But we added the second a uh, solo master so you could switch and do a lead boost. You could also change, there's two switch functions that you, that you can also switch. But the way he's doing it, it's just a, just a, a boost in volume and it worked really, really well. It sounds great, it's mean and uh, tons of gain if you want it, but very, like it works really well in a mix. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that's modeling, that's digital, that promises all kinds of things with that. But this, for especially for quicksand, there's no distortion pedals, there's no boost pedals. It's just all the gain comes from the amp, and uh, it sounded great at rehearsal. And, and you know, they they played Stone Pony. I think they're playing two nights at, at the Troubadour. Yeah, they're, out, they're out doing a, a pretty big tour. Yeah. And Sergio, um, you know, he. I just wanted to just tie a thread here. Is that? Mm -hmm. So Sergio from Quicksand and Deftones, when he was on your show, we were talking about how to, you know, he uses actual like effects like phase shifter and delay and other stuff on his bass. And I just questioned him, like, how do you ever, I've never been able to incorporate effects like that in any of the band that I've been in. And he said, well, the trick is 
you start first, meaning he writes the riffs with the effects and then it's just embedded in the tune. So it works that way. And that's kind of, um, you know, what I love about what, what you just said, talked about Paris, about how, you know, when you, when you start with the bass as the, as the, as the center of the songwriting that, you know, you get, you know, it, 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 instead of having to find a place to add it, it is the center and it holds its own. So that's a, that's a, that's a cool thing. So I just like to share this stuff because anytime I hear different ways of, you know, being creative, you know, that's what we're all doing this for. So uh, it's tons of fun and, um, you know, there's tons more stuff coming out with Fryat and Sound City and more bands. And so everybody can just, you know, go check it out. Also, one last thing is that every other week on the Fryat Amps YouTube channel, there's a podcast with Steve Fryat and Joe Gamble, and they talk about, they like just geek out. So if you, you know, anybody wants to, learn you know every little possible detail and also story about who's using this stuff uh, that's a fun thing to do especially if you're just sort of you know just want to just take your time and just go with it and go down the rabbit hole about gear okay well thank you bro um i mentioned one thing was right before the pandemic see you, paris thanks Right. I'm glad to see you on the show. I could, you know, I mean, come on. I got memories of being on the set for the Onyx video. I got memories. Of, <laughs> I got memories of shooting on the rooftop, the Antidote Return to Burn video on the roof in Long Island City. I mean, you know, there's, we, I could go on and on, but. Paris, no. you were going to say something? Just on the fry it tip, um, before the pandemic, I was out in LA jamming with Roy Lozano and uh, we used the fry it amps and it was, uh, Brutal. That's probably Roy little, 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 little Roy's a waves the Fryette flag hard, yo. I mean, yeah. just even if it was just him there, he, you know, because when he when he told me to come out, he was like, "Just bring your guitar. I got everything taken care of with amps." And I walked into this room, and it was just it was like a display in a store, just <laughs> all this stuff. And he goes, "Which you know, he goes plug in here, and this is what happens." Blah blah blah. And we just started jamming and it was just thunderous. Cool. Yeah, he's hey, awesome. He's, he's a loyal soldier. Yeah. Thank you, Zum. I love you, bro. I'll talk to you soon. Love you guys. See you. Bye. Yeah. Here's one for you, man. Um, where did I just, I saw a good one. Wait. And just, just in case anybody is wondering if you ever watched my playthrough of Chaos Magic, where I mentioned, uh, I mentioned that I play the bass through a sans amp and I say, thank you, Zum. That's who I was talking about. Got it. Um, here's a question from Heggs. Have you ever been starstruck while filming? And here's the accompanying photo. Not that you're starstruck in this photo, but you, this is um, Robert Downey Jr. AKA Iron Man, correct? It is. He, Have you he, ever been starstruck while filming? Um, I was definitely, um, I was, I definitely enjoyed the day when I shot Eric Roberts because I love oh, the wow. movie Pope of Greenwich Village. Of course. And he was just so stone cold cool on set. Uh, and I already, you know, wanted to work with him and meet him and all that kind of stuff. And he sure. was just, you know, it's not like we talked or anything. Like there are plenty of actors that I've talked to and, uh, and, and gotten along with well that I, you know, respected and thought was cool, but there's just something about the Pope of Greenwich Village because those characters aren't characters in a movie, they're real, at least, you know, to the people who love those movies. And and I loved um, shooting Eric Roberts. Uh, who else could I think of? Who is this? Is this Helen Hunt in this shot with you? That is Helen Hunt. I did a movie with her. Uh, uh, yo, big big ups on the Wohop shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. Yeah, I come on. <laughs> But yeah, I did this movie with Helen. She wrote it, directed it, and starred in it with Matt right? Midler. Uh, it was called Then She Found Me. And she oh, was, wow. you know, she's obviously been on set her whole life. Her whole you know, life. Being a child star. And she right. was very, very camera savvy and very steady cam savvy. And she right? and together designed lots of super long, cool, steady cam shots. And not a single one made it into the movie. But oh, she tried. <laughs> and she was also really nice because, like, 
my mother at the end of her life, you know, she, she was actually in the neighborhood when we were shooting and she had texted me. I was like, Oh, please come down, please come down. And she came down to the set and I just kind of grabbed her in the shoulders and I dragged her over to like the camera assistant's uh, monitor where, where he was pulling focus. And the camera assistant was like, Oh, I'll go pull focus from over there so she can have the monitor herself. And I would just stand there like making sure she was standing there. Okay. And, um, and then I went and I did this very elaborate long shot. And when the shot was over, uh, Helen walked over to the monitor where my mother was. And then she asked for them to play it back. And so her and my mom, her and my mom are standing there watching. And when the take is over, and I'm standing there next to her, when the take is over, she goes, Thank you very much, Paris. You are an artist with the steady cam. Oh. And she walked away. And then my mom was like, all you know, gushing and she left and I walked up to Helen. I was like, that was very kind of you. She goes, yeah, I thought that would work for you. <laughs> <laughs> super nice woman and super what's, talented director and super, you know, obviously everybody knows she's a great actress. What's going on here? This is a TV show, The Affair. Okay. Cause it, it was, it, you sent it to me and it said Affair. I, I was confused. Is it a car? What is he shooting? I wasn't sure what it was exactly. Yeah. It's a TV show called The Affair. And they uh, they they primarily shoot in in Los Angeles, but um, uh -huh. they shoot the Montauk session section in Montauk, or at least they sure. did. And I did the Montauk sh section of the affair. It was it was cool working with a cool DP, great director. Got it. Hey, uh, somebody wants to say hi, man. Uh, Rap bones, what's up? Oh, well, intro. What's up, Paris? What's up, no, we did the we did the intro. You were on the show in early I in the know, show. Do you need the intro again? Always. No, I'm kidding. It's great to see you, Paris, man. It's great to see you too. And in your honor, what do you got? I brought this. Oh, oh the Star Trek, Mr. Spock. Nice. In the rapper and all that kind of stuff. I don't know what any a friend of mine named Scott, who is like got a massive Star Trek collection. Whenever he just doesn't have any room, he calls me up and he's like, I got this. Do you want it? And I'm like, of course I want it. Wow, nice. that's awesome. Is that yeah, is that like an is that an oldie? Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. This is like, you know, from well, it's from the motion picture, so it's not that old. I guess right. from the early 80s. But I thought I think I thought, yeah. I thought we would appreciate it, Rap Bones. I think the first Star Trek, the motion picture was like 70s, wasn't it? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Hold on, let me look. Go ahead, Rap Bones. Uh, you know, I kind I got I got a question for Paris, and you guys didn't really touch on it. Seventy nine. Uh, yep. I was asking earlier, but uh, wh how, what are your feelings on uh, near death experience? I think that's like an unsung Chromax record. It's kind of like a hidden gem. It's a pretty metal record. I really enjoy it. I like it. And, oh boy, uh, here we go. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not. It's not bad. But uh, how do you feel about that record? And also, uh, did you ever fall into the Krishna thing with everybody? Uh, I don't. I don't ever know. Notice that you were a follower of the Krishna conscious back then. And how did you feel about that? And I know for that's myself, two is enough. I know for myself, being that young and learning about Krishna consciousness through a band like that, the Chromags. Uh, I didn't know. I thought those were people that handed out flowers and pamphlets at the airport, and their kids went to a cult. So. It, it shed a, a more, uh, you know, light on that for me to take that more seriously. And, uh, you know, I find whatever, you know, gives you a, a positive mental attitude in life is going to be good, you know. But, you know, how did you feel about that? And did you like that record yourself, Near Death Experience? I much preferred The Wrath of Khan to the motion picture. <laughs> you don't like that record. I mean, the speech, you know, I am, your, you know, I am and will always be your friend between Kirk and Spock was just the best scene ever in a movie. Good. Well put. All right. Good. Well I, said. All right. Well said. That brother. answered my question, I guess. All right. What else? Uh, Ken. I got this for you, Ryan Collins. <laughs> 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 you know, I love you throwing. But, but, but since since I preempted those questions, you can ask two more. Well, uh, here, Chuck Chucky Brown asks, can he speak on creating the cinematography? Cine can he speak on creating the cinematography thesis at the School of Visual Arts? I believe he submitted three videos: Flotsam and Jetsam, Gang Green, and I forgot the other. What is that? 
Yeah. Well, what happened was I, I was going into my my last year of 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 uh, the School of Visual Arts, and you're generally expected to make a thesis film as a director. And I'd already started working as a DP. I had shot these videos, and I also didn't want to attend class. It was like when the band was touring, so I went to the to the head of the department. And I said, "Listen, I want you to create a, a cinematography category instead of a direct. It, it can't just be directing because it's not even a realistic goal to have all these students think they're going to be directors. There's different places that you can go within the film business. You know, I was just making this shit up because I wanted to get a degree, but I didn't want to make a thesis film. And I said, I propose that I that I submit three jobs that I've shot to get uh, my degree, but it, make it a cinematography." cinematography degree and they agreed and i became the first person to have a cinematography degree at the, the school of visual arts cool uh, and i believe the third video was the chrome mags we got enough video i got a tie-in for you right here rap bones you ready here's a tie-in and that would be this photo right here right. now paris is on the left with the steady cam rig and rap bones is right in right in his right in his right in the lens. Yeah, that's yep. uh, you know, thanks for putting me in the shades of gray video too. I mean, you know, that that got me some street cred, you know. I mean, 90s were rough, you know. I was off and off of Rikers Island and I'd be able to use the TV because they'd come call me out of my bunk or whatever. Yo, you're on the TV again with all them crazy white boys and stuff. So it's kind of funny, man, you know. Definitely uh, yeah. help. I remember picking those shots. I remember like looking at those shots. The one where you like turn and look at the camera and go like that, and then just bolt right out into the crowd. It was just yeah, such a great. Shot. I had no choice but to put it in. Yes, thank you. Yep. And, cool. and I gotta say another we we uh, one memory. I lo you know how you always remember like who you were with when something happened uh, at the Brooklyn Bowl. HR was playing. And uh, I saw you there, and we sat, had a you know a nice exchange at the bar. And I walked away, and uh, like five minutes later on the TV, they got Osama bin Laden that night, and uh, HR was packed at the Brooklyn Bowl. Uh, and, and I like seeing that because people kind of sleep on his reggae career, and I think his reggae career was phenomenal. And I know you know I'm a big fan of his reggae stuff as well. But yeah, that was that was a, that was a funny night. Yeah, that was that. That show was the Academy in 1993, Clutch Dog Eat Dog. Yep, that's what that was. That's where we shot stuff. Rap yeah. Bones, I'll talk to you later, man. Well, guys, been a great show, man. Everyone who's been watching the show for the 150 episodes, thank you. You know, I've got a lot of uh, contact with people from the show, and it's been a it's been a good ride, man. So we'll see you guys next time. All right, Rap Bones. Bro, I like how you handled that. You've got nothing to say. Good. That was good, man. Thank you. Well, I like to talk, and I like to talk about things that I like and enjoy and make me happy. Me there's, too. There's no point in talking about things that I don't care about. No, I, I I agree, and and yeah, and I was just thinking too before I was like, man, it's all right. You know, we're we're getting out of this without any sort of weirdness. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't I don't know why you'd expect any weirdness from me. I just I, no no I mean, no 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 not from you. We talked yeah, about a pre-show. I was more concerned with outside. You know, no, no, that's that's what I was referring to. Not weirdness from you. I was talking about like outside weirdness. Or as um, they as they said in Star Trek, as Kirstie, uh, what's her name? What's the what's the girl from uh, that Star Trek episode? Kirstie Alley. Sabotage. Sabotage. The the they have the you know the the wooden shoes and they throw them into the windmills and it's called the and the, and the shoes are called sabo, and that's where you get the word sabotage. What Star Trek was that? I don't. Know. Who's, who's the who's the older hot chick from uh, Sex and the City? Kim Cattrall was in Star Trek movie, and she is that right? Vulcan, right? And she gives that speech about sabotage. Uh, Joe Ackerman down in Tallahassee, Florida, asks Paris, "Can you speak on touring with Motorhead? Any Lemmy stories?" I have a million Lemmy stories. <laughs> a million of them. And I tell you. Touring with Motorhead was amazing. You know, it's everything you'd want it to be. Everything everything you've ever thought you'd want somebody that you admire as a musician to be, Lemmy was that person. He was supportive. He was genuine. He was no bullshit. He defended you. He was, 
he was, you know, he was Iron Man. He was like a superhero, greatest guy. And one time, me, Doug Holland, and Lemmy were standing in a club, uh, standing by a pool table, you know, leaning up against the wall, watching the pool game, you know, hanging out before the show. Because Lemmy did that. He just always hung out in the crowd. I think most people who encountered him in public realize he's very approachable. But we're standing there, and this, like, little hooshy mama comes walking by, and she stands in front of Lemmy, and she's, like, tits out. And, she's, and she leans over, and she's like, and she's whispering <laughs> in Lemmy's ear that we can't hear. And she leans back and she's like, and Lemmy goes, I've done so much speed tonight, my dear, you couldn't find my cock. <laughs> and that was it. That makes... Uh... It was endless. Yeah. Yep. Or I can tell you about how, you know, we went out on tour with Motorhead and we played the first couple of shows and we never saw them. And we also heard that they didn't want us on the show. Because they, you know, they weren't into the whole slam dancing thing and all that yeah. stuff, and yeah. we we represented that. We represented like you know the pinnacle of that kind of boy, thing. Boy, and boy, did you, huh? And uh, and so after about two or three gigs, I started to notice Wurzel was standing on the side of the stage when we were doing sound check, watching us. And then that night, he was on the side of the stage watching us play the gig. And then the next day, it was Wurzel and Phil, the other guitar player, watching us. Yeah. And then the next night. It was Lemmy, Wurzel, and Phil watching us during sound check, and then at the gig. And then that night, Lemmy went on, on a radio show, and, he, and for the first time he mentioned us, he was like, you got to come out and see this band, the Cro-Mags. They're great. They're tearing it up. They're warming up the show real good. And, you know, you got to come out early to see the Cro-Mags. And we were, like, astonished. It was fantastic. And then that next day, we uh, went to do sound check. You also got to understand, you know, this is when Motorhead was at their peak. And they showed up with a truck with their own PA. So we'd pull into these like medium-sized clubs and they would set up their PA in front of the existing PA. And then they set up this giant board in the middle of the dance floor and they had the sound guy do their sound. And then we would play and it would be like, dun, 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 dun. and the motorhead would come out and play. It was like, <laughs> like the loudest shit you ever heard. And we sounded like nothing compared to them. But that fourth night after they watched us night after night, we walked out and, uh, let me sound guy was standing behind the board and he just goes bass drum and Petey's like what bass drum hit the bass drum <laughs> he starts going like this and we're like uh and i was like hey what's going on and he said let me inform me that i am doing your sound for the rest of the tour wow i mean so generous like he certainly didn't have to do that and he did and that was just oh, the beginning yeah. of his acts of generosity and I can talk about Lemmy all day, but I'll move on to the next question. Uh, Chucky Brown says, Drew, please ask him when his father went into a re went to a record store and saw a punk chick with a Cro-Mag shirt. I think it was during the Best Wishes time Best Wishes came out. Is there a story there? Is there a... Yeah, you know, my dad, you know, he was a music publisher. So he would go into these uh, like mom and pop record stores and try to find bootlegs, you know, to use as evidence in court and things like that to know who's bootlegging him because he had a, a vast catalog. And uh, he was in this one record store in Nashville called The Trader. And he was walking around. He gathered a collection of tapes and, and records that he, he owned the songs on uh, that were bootlegs. And he brought them up to the counter. And when he got to the counter, he, you know, he, he tells me the story. He's like, he's like, the other day I was at The Trader buying some records. And there's this cute little girl behind the bar with purple hair. <laughs> and I said, yeah. He goes, and she was wearing a Cro-Mags t-shirt. And I was like, oh, yeah. And he goes, so I leaned over and I said, I said, hey, you know, my son is in that band. And you know what she said to me? She said, liar. <laughs> You're a liar. Your son is not in the chrome. She goes, no, I swear to God. And, and, and he goes, and it was at that moment when she called me a liar is that I realized that your band was actually popular. Because she was mad that I was claiming that. I said, did you get her number? <laughs> it the truth comes out in mysterious ways, huh? Yeah. What, what was, you know, I, I remember this, uh, but memories of Cro-Mags, S.O.D., Wendy O., Motorhead at the Ritz. I thought I heard you guys had to play after Motorhead that night. No, we didn't you guys, play. You didn't we play didn't, at all that night. We didn't play at all. Yeah, I remember that. I was there. Got, you know, Lemmy, they had, to, they had to travel to the next show, and Lemmy didn't want to go on that late, and somebody had to go, and, 
and we were the band that had to go. And it was it was it was devastating for me because I was a huge yeah. Motorhead fan. I mean, I had seen Motorhead in '79 and '80, and oh. and I went alone, you know, because I didn't know anybody who knew them. And then by the time it was eight, '86 and we were playing this gig with them, it was like this tremendous thing for me. And then we were just we we were literally all, all our gear was on stage, and you know the the Clockwork Orange music was playing. Oh, and I was tuning my guitar when Chris Williamson walked up to me. He says, "You guys aren't playing." Oh. And that was it. And we literally packed up our stuff and left. Oh, and it, was, man. it became this thing where like John Jefferson was running around the club, storming around saying, I'm going to fucking kick Lemmy's ass. And I remember like when we were loading out our gear, Lemmy came walking out and John confronted Lemmy. And in typical Lemon, Lemmy gentleman form, you know, with all J John trying to be rooster chested and intimidate him, Lemmy, Lemmy didn't back down at all. He just looked at him and said, listen, man, it's nothing personal. He's like, we just got to get get going. Whoever yeah. booked this show booked one too many bands. Yeah. You know, it's nothing personal. That's it. It's business. And if you don't like it, I don't know what to tell you. And he just walked past John and left John standing there. And I witnessed the whole thing. And it's, you know, it still bothered me, but at least I heard that. Yeah. I heard his version of it. And yeah, you know, and subsequently getting to know him, I know yeah. he's like shit. It's just, plans it's just one of those things. It was a scheduling thing. I mean, they could, have kicked, they could have bumped SOD. That was my opinion. You're right. You know, but they didn't. Any plans on touring? Michael Michael LaRoche asks. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to establish, reestablish myself as a musician. You know, the aggros is my new, you know, way of, of, of uh, it's my new vehicle for my songwriting. Uh, it's, and, it's, and it's an invitation to other, you know, other musicians. I'm looking for other musicians to to fill out the band and to go on tour and if i got offered you know gigs tomorrow i would just hire a band and to perform the songs or i would assemble a band quickly you know but with covid there was no reason to rush into putting together a touring band i didn't want to do that and just you know have to stop because of the delta variant or whatever and i see tours getting started and stopped and started and stopped and all during the pandemic there was no reason at all and it wasn't really practical to get together with people but uh when the time comes, you know, there, you know, I'll put together a spectacular band and we'll perform these songs and it'll be great. Cool. You know, I, I've reached, you know, I've reached out to former booking agents. I've reached out to, uh, you know, other people and people are showing interest and it'll, it'll happen when it happens, but I'm not, I, I don't feel good with, about the idea of putting together a band, getting them in shape and then just having them sit around. I'd yeah. I know that things are going to be going, things are moving. Yeah. And things are not moving for a while still. So. Yeah. And in the interim, I'm going to keep introducing these songs, you know, one at a time and, and, and build up my identity as a musician. I mean, I have an identity as a musician anyway, but, you know, it, it, the aggros is basically just a continuation of what I've always done. It, what you can expect is what I've always done. I just write songs and I put them out. That's what I'm going to keep doing. Right on. Well, hey, three and a half hours, bro. That was great. Three and a half hours, and I feel like we get we got another hour and a half in us. But I'm I'm getting hungry. I don't know about you, but uh, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, it was great. You know, we had a couple of laughs, and and we took a nice walk down memory lane. Is there anybody you want to shout out or thank or anybody like that? Um, yeah, Cobbs. I'm glad you showed his picture. You know, Cobbs is a great guy and a great musician. And although we we're not playing together, I wish him all the luck in the world. He's tremendous and. He'll land somewhere. Uh, I definitely want to give him a shout out. And uh, my man, Mark, who's uh, I'm re recording at his studio, Red Room Studios in Brooklyn. And he's a great guy. And Vinny is the engineer. And uh, and also, you know, we should, can I do these social media things? Yeah, my yeah, yeah. Now? You should have given me those beforehand. Hold on. I know, I know. But well, it's I got like, this one. I got the one that's underneath the IG, which is, which is you personally. But there it is. YouTube, the Agros website. Oh, www.agros.nyc. Right yeah, that's, on. That's the official site. But to me, the most important one is, is the uh, YouTube. You know, if anybody wants to do anything to support the band or the music, if you like the music or if you like this talk, go to YouTube, go to the Agros on YouTube and subscribe. Because in, in this digital age, that's the kind of shit that promoters look at. You know, this, you know, I just yeah. got asked the question, are you going to play live? You know what promoters do now? They go on YouTube and they look how many subscribers you have. 
Yep. You have a lot of subscribers. They'll say, maybe I should book this guy, Paris. And, and you, you may think to yourself, oh, he was in the Chromags. All that shit is taken care of. But it's not. They look at your followers. They look at your subscribers. So please, you know, if you want to if you want to jump on board, you want to be part of the Chromags army, do something that is so simple. You know, I'm not a record company guy. I don't have a record company. I'm doing this all myself. It's DIY everything. I record everything. I direct the videos myself. I write the songs myself. I'm putting it out just for the sole purpose is because I have no choice. I'm a musician and a filmmaker, and I'm doing it because I love it, and I'm doing the best I can. And, you know, I'm not charging anything for it. I'm not selling anything. So if you could just go on there and subscribe, that would be the thank you. They check your analytics these days. What are yeah. his analytics? Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. But I know I know, because I've spoken to a couple of promoters. I've spoken to a couple of people. They're like, how many followers do you have? Yeah. So follow. It's simple. It's just press a button. I'm not asking you to spend no money. Just, just, And I've got a thousand, like over a thousand followers, which is supposedly some kind of landmark thing on YouTube because I haven't had the page for very long. And, I'll, and all I do is put my music on there. So, Well, when the next yeah. uh, when the next video gets done, you have to come on and, we'll, and we'll, 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 we'll play the video and we'll, we'll talk some more. Oh, that would be great, but it's going to be very soon. It's going to be Halloween. Halloween? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I'd be happy to come back. All right, let's talk soon, man. Thank you very much. Thank you, Drew. I really, I really appreciate you sharing your audience with me. My pleasure, my old friend. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Well, there you have it. 150th landmark episode. I hope you enjoyed it at least half as much as I did. Our guest was Paris Mayhew, the filmmaker and musician. Uh, keep in mind, this Wednesday coming up is Handsome Dick Manitoba. The hits keep coming. Uh, Daryl Kahan, you were out there, huh? Oh, thanks, Daryl. Good to know. Thanks for, you know. Gajewski, glad you enjoyed it. Um, it was great. It was really nice to connect with my old friend and have a couple of laughs. Uh, AJ, thank you. Uh, it was a great show. Great show. Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah. Thank you for everybody. If you hung in for three and a half hours, man, my, my hat is off to you. You know, that was a lot. That was one of the longest shows that we've done. Hey, Andrea, hope you're well out there. David, get the funk out of my face. I hope you're well, brother. Thank you, everybody. Um, 150 shows. We got a whole bunch of, of great ones. Thank you, Ray. I can't, I honestly couldn't do it without all your support. I truly mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, how lucky am I? I'm doing something that I really love doing. I fell into it. I stepped in it. <laughs> I stepped in it, Dave. All right. How about your giants, bro? Yeah. All good, man. So that said, um, have a good night, everybody. I'll see you on Wednesday. Until then, do good things and good things will come to you.